Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, May 21st, 2017, episode 1389. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. By Quicken Loans, when it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash guy. And by Upside, the smart new way to save big money on business travel. Visit Upside.com, enter the code TECHGUY. You're guaranteed at least a $100 gift card when you book your first trip. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, yeah. Yeah, your worst nightmare, a geek with his own radio show. <laughs> I'm going to talk like geeks. No, I'm going to try to talk English. Speak the mother tongue. Uh, but if if I lapse into geek, you'll slap me around, won't you? 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. See, I'm kind of here as an amb ambassador from the land of geekdom. I, he I, I come to you. <laughs> mended glasses on my nose. Pocket protector in my pocket. A couple of nice pens. Protractor. I've got a slide rule on my belt. But I'm here. I'm here to explain... <laughs> What's really going on? We used to have an IT guy. You always knew he was coming because he had all these keys on his belt. And he would jingle as he walked down the hall. Uh, I'm here. Yeah, what, have you tried rebooting it? <laughs> the printer won't work. Oh, uh, you rebooted three times, right? Yeah. So I won't do that to you. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Because this is, you know, we're heard all over the country, all over the U.S. And, and you know, probably just, you know, in Windsor or somewhere, like over the border in Canada. Uh, and then if you're outside that area, because of the Internet, you can hear us anywhere in the world. And I know we have listeners all over the world. We get calls all the time. Uh, just use Skype. That'll work. Skype out. You know, that's the thing that lets you call a phone. Pretty soon you'll be able to use your Google Home. You know, that artificial uh, intelligence Doohickey sitting on your table. You'll be able to use that call. Any phone number in the U.S. and Canada for free. I still can't get over that. And I know that that's a minor thing. And kids today go, well, I can do that on my cell phone. I just, maybe it's my age, but I just, I, th I think back, you know, 20 years. If we said, well, you just have this thing on your desk and you just say call, and it, you know, somebody. And it will just call them and you can talk to them and it'll be free. Free just uses the internet to do that what we live in amazing times and it just i think we get used to it. we just take it for granted there's a discontinuity i've mentioned this before between the speed with which things change in the tech world and the which they change in the normal world you know some places in this country they still have a milkman comes to your door in the morning and delivers delivers milk my mom has a milkman in rhode island he delivers milk Right? So that's like 19th century technology. <laughs> okay, he doesn't have a horse-drawn carriage, but he delivers milk. And now we've come full circle, and now you can have a robot deliver lunch in many cities of this country. Yes. If you, if you come to San Francisco or New York or, and, you, and you're walking down the street and there's a little box on wheels trundling along with lights... That's delivering food, and when it arrives at its destination, it's autonomous. It's nobody's nobody's steering it. It it knows the map of the universe. It can cross streets. <laughs> yes, it avoids pedestrians, and then it goes to the place. And then the the people who order the food come out, and they say, "Oh, hi, little robot," and they enter the code, and it opens up, and inside a steaming hot lunch. Unless the bad guys broke into it first, but apparently it's quite theft proof. So we, so it's not a milkman, but we kind of, you know, technology's brought us full circle. 
Uh, we talked yesterday about WannaCry. It's a good name for a virus. This is the uh, ransomware virus that last week I wasn't here. I'm sorry, and I apologize. I took I had a flu. How come we still have flu? Aren't we in the 21st century? How come we still have the flu? Anyway, <laughs> I got the flu and uh, was uh, not able to do the show. And I felt terrible. I'm lying here. I'm a little feverish thinking they need me. They need me. Let me at them. Come on. I got to do the show. Who's going to tell them what to do about WannaCry? Well, by now, you know, either got it or you didn't. I don't. I think that uh, it really didn't hit the U.S. very badly, but we know there were several hundred thousand infections worldwide and some really serious things. This is a ransomware bug that spread via email, you know, primarily email from banks. You know, if you get an email from your bank saying you're overdrawn, quickly open this uh, file or log in or whatever and uh, and fix it. You you might. And the bad guys hope you might just panic and say, oh, oh. that's what, ransomware uh, usually comes through an email attack called a phishing attack, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, a phishing attack. And these emails simulate uh, something you might, you know, the IRS or your boss, you know, it can come from somebody you know, it often does, your bank or your boss. And it's usually something urgent. Smithers! I need this spreadsheet on my desk by 9 a.m. tomorrow. And you go, <laughs> and you open it, and then, boy, the boss is going to be mad because now you've not only infected your computer, locked it up, encrypted the files, but all the, uh, all the computers on the network. Mostly Windows 7 machines affected. No Windows 10 machines. And if you've been patching, like a good little boy or girl, if you've been patching, uh, Microsoft sent out a patch in March, so your system is safe. But lots of businesses don't always put the updates uh, on machines because they, for whatever reason, they have to test them, certify them. There's a, uh, so WannaCry is out there. It was kind of stymied initially because uh, very kind of, it had a, you know, it's an interesting virus. And I think there's some evidence that it's actually not by your typical hacker, but more likely by a nation state like North Korea that just wanted to sow disruption. Because among other things, it had what we call a kill switch. The virus, before it encrypts all your data, would go out and see if a website existed, a really obscure, long, random named website. If it did not exist, if it couldn't go to that website, then the virus would activate. So they call that a kill switch because if the bad guys then registered that website, which was they thought known only to them, uh, then the virus would just stop working. It would go, oh, I see the site. I guess, you know, I guess it's over now. We can go home. So an intrepid security researcher noticed this in the code and registered the website, and that kind of stopped the virus. In fact, now there's wannabe bad guys who have the wanna cry code. You know, you can get that and, you know, just get infected. <laughs> you can get it, but you can look at an email or whatever. And they saw and they noticed this kill switch. So they've edited it out of the code kind of crudely. Or <laughs> this is kind of funny. They're DDoSing that site. They're trying to make it unresponsive so that the virus will still work. I think these are copycats. I don't think this is the original virus author. And now we've heard that there may be a fix. But there's a catch. So another security researcher, it's funny because this virus spread because of a bug in Windows, right? A bug which Microsoft fixed. A bug which was discovered by the NSA, our National Security Agency, and kept to itself for a while so they could use it to spy on people. But then it turned out that it, that, that leaked. We don't know how. Bad guys got it, and they made a virus with it. But ironically, the fix for the virus is another bug in Windows. <laughs> Not yet patched. Uh, the bad guys who wrote WannaCry used Microsoft's own cryptographic system to encrypt your drive. Well, it turns out that encryptographic system leaves the code, the prime numbers used for the encryption, in memory. It just lets them sit there in memory until the machine is rebooted. So if you didn't, if you got WannaCry and you didn't reboot, there's a tool that examines your memory, finds the
the keys and unlocks your drive. Oh, Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft giveth and they taketh away. The, the bottom line, though, patch your windows. Always patch it as quickly as you can. We're going to take a break, then come back with phone calls. I want to hear from you. 8888-ASK-LEO. Did you get bit? Do you want to cry? 888-827-5536. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Lo and behold, look who's here. She's back from the Bahamas. She keeps going to the Bahamas. I don't know if I'll be going back, but I think I've done what I need to do there. The Bahama girl, Kim bah Kim O oh, the Bahamas Schaefer. Bahama Mama. Bahama Mama. <laughs> Manana Bahama Mama. Yeah. Rock nice. the cash bar. As they say, <laughs> I was rocking the cash bar. I, rocked the, I saw that you were at a swim up bar, and it said if you can't, if you can reach this bar, you can have a drink. And you didn't. You almost. I didn't, almost didn't make it, right? <laughs> I great. love swim up bars. Those are great. Yeah, Those are that, fun. that was a lot of fun. I had a lot Good. of fun in there. <laughs> Good. Well, anyway, we're welcome back. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I see you've been working hard. You've been mm. slaving over a hot phone bank and and delivered up some pipe and fresh callers. Who should I? Uh, who should I start with? Let's go with Joe Vaughn in Lyons, Georgia. He's got a new computer and he wants to transfer his files and he doesn't want to have to go to a shop to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Javon. Leo uh, hello, Leo. Good to talk to you. What can I oh, do? Oh, thank you. What can I do for you today? Um, uh, let's see. I already had this computer several years ago. Uh, uh, I will, let me see. I was going to no, no excuse me. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Don't take a deep breath. It's just you and me, my friend. There's no uh, one else listening. It's just us. We're having a nice phone conversation. You and me. How are? By the way, tell me about Lyons, Georgia. Is that a small town? Uh, yes, it is. Do you like uh, it there? Uh, it's okay. Uh, well, well it's okay. Uh, well, I prefer the big city. Uh, so anyway, I had this computer several years ago when I first bought it. I wanted to get all my old information, including uh, uh, like main. Let's get. Uh, uh, are you nervous? Oh uh, yes, uh, hold, hold, hold. Why are you nervous? Now come on, it's just me. Uh, okay, okay, I'm your old buddy. <laughs> uh, uh, call me Uncle Leo. That might make it helpful. Is that helpful? All right, Uncle Leo. Okay. <laughs> when I first got the when I first got the computer, yeah, it had your. Did it, now this new computer did it have your stuff on it, or you, you wanted the old computer to put stuff on the new computer, right? I first wanted like the old hard drive to actually be put into like the. Into yeah. the computer. Yeah. Uh, but the guy told me He's, that he couldn't. Yeah. He, so yeah. It's not a good it. idea. It's not a good idea. Oh. Oh. So, but but what you can do is copy the data, everything from the old drive to the new drive. You can do that. Uh, I don't know how. Oh. Uh, uh, I can help you. Long story short. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Go ahead. Tell uh, me the. Make a long story short. Yeah. I still got. I still got the old hard drive though, but it is still in its of a bag. So what I would, a couple of things you could do. So the new computer is working fine, right? Oh, uh, well, yes. So uh, well, if I can tell you what model is. It no, I don't need to know the model. That's not important. So okay, the new computer is working fine, right? Yes. Yeah, you're using it. But you still have the old computer, and there's stuff on that old computer that's not on the new computer that you want to get on the new computer. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, I only got, like, the hard drive. Yeah, I understand. Like the old computer, though. Yeah. So here's what you do. About 39 bucks. I think everybody should have one of these uh, if you mess around with computers and you take them apart and all that stuff. About 39 bucks. You can go to a company called, there are a company, company, number of companies make these, but you go to a company called Newer Tech, N E W E R T E C H, and they make something they call the Universal Drive Adapter. It'll take any bare bones drive. Of any size, laptop, uh, all the way up to the big five and a quarter inch drives in the older computers, I bet you that's what you've got. 
and it connects that drive bare bones, just as if, you know, not even in a computer, just, you know, electronics and everything just hanging out there. It connects it and turns it into a USB drive. And then you can just plug that into the new computer and browse around in the old disk, see the stuff you want, and copy it over. The reason the guy wouldn't just take the drive out of the old computer and put it in the new computer is, you know, Windows is set up for the old computer, including all the drivers and stuff. And it's just kind of a recipe for disaster to take a drive that boots Windows on one bit of hardware and put it in the new bit of hardware. So he did the right thing. Your, you know, your question is reasonable, though. Now, the problem with this, first of all, it's cheap. It's nice. Uh, and it's a good thing to have for, for emergency or one-time use. I think it's like 30 bucks. Newertech.com. We'll put a link at the show notes. They call it the USB Universal Drive Adapter. But you wouldn't want to use it every day because the drive's sitting out there, electronics and everything. I mean, yeah, he's not going to electrocute you, but it's not its not a healthful situation. It's not something you want to do all, all the time. So if you want always to have access to that drive, for a little more money, maybe 50 or 60 bucks, you can go down to your local electronics store or buy it online at Amazon and so forth. You get a USB enclosure, they call it. And that'll take any drive. you got to get one that matches your drive. So you got to look at that drive. It's probably a SATA, a SATA drive. Might be an IDE drive. You got to figure out what kind of drive it is, because the connector is different, right? The nice thing is about these universal drive adapter. It just has all these different connectors to work with anything. But if you're going to get a permanent enclosure, you want one that matches. And then you just open up the enclosure. You pop in your drive, connect up the wires, close up the enclosure, and now that old drive is a USB backup drive. It's there. You plug it into your new computer. You could see your stuff. And I think that's kind of handy because then you can, uh, you know, after you get everything off of it, use it as a backup drive or a reference drive and not get all your stuff there. So that's, to me, the best way uh, to do it. There's actually two ways there. If you're going to do it one time only just to copy your data off, get the inexpensive universal drive adapter. If you're going to do it longer, get a drive enclosure. The same company, Newer Tech, makes... Another thing, we were talking yesterday with a guy who uh, has a hard drive. It's kind of like a toaster. <laughs> you pop hard drives in. We've used these, too. Um, and uh, and it, it, it's kind of in between the permanent enclosure and the, and the temporary adapter. They call it the Voyager. And you just pop. And if you had a bunch of drives, you just pop those in. Problem is, I don't, you know, in the long run, this is not a super reliable way to do it. So if you want to keep that drive around and you got lots of stuff on it and you just want to have it always, get a USB enclosure. If your new computer supports USB 3.0, the fast USB standard, get a USB 3.0 enclosure. Uh, if it doesn't, if you know, USB 2 is fine. And if it's a really if the old computer was really, really old, Jovan, then you might want to. Just get a USB 2 because it will probably be a pretty slow hard drive. So, you know, USB 3 is faster than some hard drives, some of the older hard drives out there. Okay, Jovan, give my love to everybody in Lions. I want, I want some peach pie next time you come out here, okay? Bring some out here for me. 8888 Ask Leo. All that stuff I just mentioned, all the three different products, we'll put those on the show notes. James DeRuvo is very good. He's writing right now as I speak. And putting it up at techguylabs.com. And that's free. There's no sign-up or anything. It's just it's just there for you. We put all the links, everything I talk about. Plus, after the show, audio and video, techguylabs.com. No sign-up or anything. In fact, you can even add your comments. You, we do want you to sign in for that just to make sure we don't get too much spam. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number if you want to talk high tech. In an hour from now, we're going to join um, Chris Marquardt. Actually, he is, as we speak, sailing in a schooner around Svalbard, up way up in the north, uh, you know, Norwegian region uh, that's as close as you can get, I think, to the North Pole habitated. Habit, habit, habitated? Habit inhabited place nearest the North Pole for a photo expedition. But we had the prudence, the forethought to record something with him, and we'll get that in about an hour. 8888 Ask 
Leo. Let's get back to the phones. And next, Kenny from Springfield, Missouri. Hello, Kenny. Hello, how are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for hanging on. What can I do for you? Uh, yes, I was looking to get an Android. I wanted to get the cheapest Android phone with the latest operating system. So my favorite, yeah, see, that's a usually a mismatch, right? So you do want the latest operating system from Android. In this case, it's Nougat or 7, Android 7. And I think the current iteration, if you were to have a, a you know, I think only the people using Google phones, the Pixels, have the latest iteration. Let me just check on my Pixel. Yeah, it's 7.1.2. But anything 7 and above would be good. Uh, the problem is the least expensive phones often have older versions of Android on them. The one I would recommend is from Motorola, which was a Google company. Uh, and then Google decided to get out of the physical hardware business, and they sold it to Lenovo, a Chinese company. But they still make very good phones. And to my, it's my understanding they're still being made and designed uh, by the Chicago Motorola uh, that made the original phones. And they make something called the Moto G. And it has two advantages. It uses the latest Android. But they also don't mess it up too much. They had a few Motorola extensions, which I think in most cases are quite good. Uh, but it's very clean. And the, 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 the G fourth generation is $179.99 list, which means you might even be able to find it for less. And there's a new uh, fifth generation that might even be more up to date. I don't know if that's available uh, yet or about to become available, but that's the Moto Motorola. I've seen the, the G5 Plus. Yeah, that's it. The G5. Uh, plus, that starts at two hundred thirty dollars. Uh, you know, if you get that, I think that is a superb, virtually flagship quality Android phone. That Motorola is good about keeping it up to date. Great battery life. Uh, good, decent camera. That's one of the things you give up. It actually has a fingerprint reader, which often these sub four hundred dollar phones don't. I think this is a, my favorite. I love the Moto G series. Okay, we're. Where could I find the G5 Plus for two? You said two thirty. Yeah, Motorola sells it directly at Motorola dot com, um, and that would be an unlocked version. Who's your carrier? Uh, AT and T. No problem. You could just pop an AT and T SIM in there, and it'd work just fine. You might check with AT and T and see if they sell it. Some some carriers do sell it, but if they don't, you can get it directly from Motorola. The nice thing is it's not carrier locked if you get it from Motorola, which means you could move it to T Mobile or somewhere else if you felt like it. Okay, so Motorola sells it for two thirty. Okay. Yeah, that's the list price. So, like I said, AT and T may offer you a better deal just to keep you as a customer. Okay, now now I see the um, they have two models, a sixty four and a thirty two. Um, yeah, that's how much storage. Yeah, that's how much storage you have, and that's where you pay more is if you go for sixty four. Do you? What do you have right now? What are you using right now? Uh, an iPhone. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for the new iPhone to come out. This is just uh, a, a stopgap. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, and you may be waiting a long time. There's rumors the iPhone might not be even the newest top-of-the-line iPhone, the 10th anniversary with the fancy screen and all that, may not be available to early next year. They'll announce it in the fall. but uh, So you may be waiting a long time. So it's not a bad idea. Here we are in May. Maybe uh, you know, you'd get six months out of it. That's not bad. Oh, okay, when I when I see on Amazon they had one for um, two thirty nine, but it had something like uh, Amazon ads or something like that. Or... Yeah, it doesn't bother me. You'd have to decide. They, it's, not, it's not a huge savings, right? They take ten twenty bucks off, and then when you turn on the phone on the lock screen, there's a little ad, and uh, I think that's you should check and see. But I think that's the only place they've done that with the Kindle too. They subsidize these phones with Amazon ads. It's I, I wish it gave you a better saving. Frankly, I oh, well, it's, well, it's um, at two thirty nine, and I think regular is three hundred for that for the sixty four gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you do want that much storage. How much do you have on your iPhone right now? Uh, One twenty eight. Yeah. Do you use it all? No. <laughs> yeah, sixty four is about right, unless you're going to store your entire music collection on there. Yeah. Well, that one has a, a micro SD slot too. Right. Oh well, in that case, but, you know what? I'd get the thirty two. And uh, and and then put a 128 or even a 256 gig micro SD card in there, and then you get more storage, and you'd know what to do with. Okay. The well, main the, memory, the internal the, memory, has to be used for most applications in the operating system. But all the data, photos, music, movies, I put a lot of. I like to carry a lot of audio books with me. It's just a quirk of mine. All of that can be stored on the SD card. 
Will there be any risk of getting the Amazon version with the ads? Or? Uh, you know, I've heard, yeah, no. There, potentially, it's possible that that ad server could impact your, I don't, no, there isn't. And I don't find the ads, but I get, you know, the Kindles I often buy with the ads for the 20 bucks savings. That's a pretty big savings, 60 bucks savings. That's pretty significant. So I would, I would, I would go for that. Take it. Snap it up. Okay. Especially since you're only going to be using it for a while. Although watch out because Android might get you. You may start using this and go, hmm, hmm, this is kind of nice. I kind of like this. One of the things, uh, if you're new to Android, that is very different than the iPhone. The iPhone, you have to use their user interface. They call it Springboard. It's the front page. You know, it's the, the list of icons, the dock, all of that. That's, you know, Apple prescribes how that works, and that's that. On Android, you they call it a launcher. It comes with... Uh, this one will come with uh, probably the Google launcher, uh, but there are many third-party launchers. You can completely change how your phone works. I use a launcher even on the Pixel. You know, I could use the default Google launcher, but on even on the Pixel and certainly on Samsung and other uh, devices where they, I, I, you know, I don't like what they do with the launcher. I put a launcher on called Action Launcher. That's my favorite. There's another one called Nova Launcher I also like quite a bit, and it gives you a lot more features. Now, it's a little disconcerting sometimes to iPhone users because suddenly there's all this stuff you can configure and mess with. And, and you know, uh, it's got widgets, for instance, which give you information uh, without opening the application on the screen. You can see what your bank balance is, what music you're playing. You can look at news headlines, that kind of thing. Action Launcher also gives you additional capabilities. You can swipe down on a folder and see the icons in it, but you can also have a default application that will launch if you just tap it. You know, sometimes all of that flexibility scares iPhone users. They go, no, I just, I just give me, <laughs> give me just a page of icons. That's all I want. Just give me a. <laughs> so if that's what you're used to, icons and folders, it, it, it may be a little disconcerting. But I think once you get used to the fact that you can customize your user interface, you can make it, you know, quite useful. Action Launcher has slide-in screens on the left and the right that you can uh, customize. The one on the left gives you a list of alf applications alphabetically. The one on the right can have the widgets that you use the most. I have my calendar, my uh, contact list, so I can make quick calls to people, and uh, my audiobook player, so I can launch right into my audiobook, and that's always available. They're just these little things I find very handy, and once you get used to them, if you're not discombobulated by all that flexibility... Reminds me of the old days of Mac versus Windows. You know, when you bought a Macintosh, Apple kind of prescribed how it should be used. And then Microsoft said, well, you can do anything you want, <laughs> which can be confusing. There's 23 different ways to open the, the uh, control panels. And, in, and now on modern Windows, there's two different kinds of control panels even. So sometimes people don't like all that variety. You have to see, see what kind of person you are. But if, as long as you've got the Motorola G, and again, a great phone, play with it a little bit. Maybe you'll find you like Android. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Edwy's on the line from Vista, California. Hello, Edwy. Hi, how are you doing, Leo? I am great. How are you? Yeah, I'm trying to set up a Raspberry Pi 3 as a file server or a uh, cloud. Wow. Yeah. So uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 is a very inexpensive $35 uh, computer running an ARM chip, and it's got Wi-Fi built in, Ethernet built in. It's got HDMI. It's actually a great kind of experimental computer. I recommend it to parents whose kids say, I want a computer. Okay, kid, have this <laughs> and learn to program because <laughs> and it runs a you know a variety of different operating systems. When you first get it, you have a little switcher, a little chooser on there that lets you choose. And most people run what's called Raspbian, which is a Raspberry Pi specific version of the Debian Linux operating system. But there are um, network attached storage operating systems you can run on Raspberry Pi, including I believe Nextcloud. What have you been trying? 
own cloud. Yeah, own cloud. Isn't there an own cloud? Next cloud is kind of own cloud, but they had a they forked. They had a schism in the open source community, and uh, next cloud is is basically the same. Is there not an own cloud uh, Raspberry Pi distribution? There is, and I've done all that, and I can't get it to go to the website that it created on my Raspberry Pi. Ah. So, your Raspberry Pi is on your personal network, right? Right. Your home network. And you're sitting right. on your home network trying to get to the Raspberry Pi. This is really a common issue. Um, the easiest way would be to figure out what the IP address of your Raspberry Pi is. Can you do that? Do you know how to do that? Yeah, I've done that. And, and then remember that, the, that own cloud comes in on a non-standard port, I think. Not port 80, which is the web browsing port. So you'll have to know, you have to figure out what your own cloud port is and add that to the address. So your address for your Raspberry Pi 192.168.1.24 colon and then whatever the uh, the port number is for the next cloud. And I know, or the own cloud, I don't remember what that is. Do you have a dedicated port when you set it up? I have port 21 dedicated. Don't use 21. Okay. <laughs> That's probably your problem. Use a higher okay. number. All those numbers under 1024 are pretty much occupied. Those are what we call the canonic, canonical ports, and there are services on all of them. 21, I'm trying to remember, is I think SMTP. I can't remember what it is. No, that's 25. But make it a, something over 1024. Okay, we could do that. Yeah. And I think that the other issue might be your router. Sometimes routers get finicky about... Yeah, 21's Telnet. That's what it is. So you don't want to use the Telnet port. Uh, you want to use... Or is it FTP? And we got the chat rooms f fighting over this. Well, so, FTP. Yeah, it's FTP. So don't use the FTP port. You want to use, uh, you know, 8000 or something. So a lot of people use 8080 because that's like the browsing port, 8000. I mean, sorry, 80, but it's... Uh, it's a little higher up. Tell them it's 22, right. 21 is FTP, and that makes sense. So you probably don't want to use anything under 1,024. You may okay. check your browser and your router to see, you make sure it's it's blocking. And ultimately, if you want to access that file server from the outside world, you're going to do something called port forwarding. That's why you want to use a high, level, high number dedicated port, because then you can port forward. You could say, hey, router, if any traffic comes in, on port 8080, route that over to that Raspberry Pi there, because that's that's special. So I I suspect, but that using a port number under 1024 is your problem. I'm not. I'm looking at um, setting up own cloud on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, normally, uh, you can do it via port 80, via the web browsing port. You'd go to 192.168.1.24 slash own cloud. So I would just I would look at the uh, the instructions, see what you know. Don't map it to port twenty one for sure. Map it to some other higher level port. They'll recommend a port probably. There's probably a standard port used for Raspberry Pi. It's not the it's not the Raspberry Pi and it's not the own cloud that's the issue. It's you know all of this networking stuff. But this is part of the fun of doing this for yourself, right? Uh, you learn a lot about how all this thing, how all these things work. I'm running uh, not on a. I started on a Raspberry Pi because it's easy and it's cheap. I ran a Minecraft server on it, but I wanted more people to get in there. And you know, the only disadvantage of a Raspberry Pi is not a very fast processor. So I ended up buying just a little cheap Intel NUC. They call them. They're little hockey puck size uh, computers, and I run uh, three Minecraft servers on there. And the trick on that is just, you know, you have to use. A dedicated port and tell your router hey if any traffic comes in on 25565 that's kind of the typical minecraft server port uh that's minecraft traffic go over to the send that over to the NUC. but do remember when you do that you're opening in effect opening a hole in your firewall your router is a firewall the way the router the router sits on the internet you know it's connected to your cable modem your dsl modem and if somebody tries to get into your home network the router looks at it and goes, I don't know. Who are you? What do you want? Go. It just bounces it. And that's what you want. What you you got to be very careful if you start opening ports because then the router will go, oh, you want to get to my server. Okay. And it will route you through. That means you've got to make sure you're running a secure server 
because somebody is now into your network. So unless you know what you're doing, I would say probably not a good idea to open up your network attached storage, your file server, your Minecraft server to the outside world until you really feel comfortable with all this and you know you can keep it secure. Um, and there are ways to do that, you know, run, run a second router and that kind of thing. 8888 Ask Leo that. We got fancy on that one. That's a, fan, that's, a, that's a geeky subject. I put on my pocket protector for that one. Uh, Grover, Orange, California. You're next. Hi, Grover. Hello, Leo. Hello. I, I, think, I've, I think I've been bugged with the uh, uh, knockoff of the uh, uh, Wanna Cry. Oh, no. What uh, happened? Somewhere. What happened? Well, <laughs> about a week ago, it popped up on my screen, and it didn't say Wanna Cry. It, it referenced, uh, I think, a Zeus or something like that. I remember that there uh, are Windows. many, 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 many ransomware viruses. Wanna Cry got a lot of attention, but it's by far not, you know, the least of, there are many, many more. Yes. Apparently so. Yeah. Yes. So the way, you know, you, does it say now, if you don't pay me, you won't ever see your data again? Well, it says no. It, there's a message at the bottom that says call Microsoft support. Oh, them. don't. Good news. That's, that's, you can ignore that one. Free number. Yeah, you that's, can ignore. That's not a ransomware. So ransomware encrypts your hard drive. This yeah. doesn't sound like yeah. ransomware. This is just your garden variety try to trick you into calling not Microsoft. They never do that. A no, it's not Microsoft. Yeah, no, a third I party. I they'll charge you. I was, I was suspicious, yes. Yeah, they'll charge you money. <laughs> it's called Zeus. They charge you money for uh, support. They will ex ask for remote access to your machine, at which point they could do a lot of damage. So the, yes. so just ignore it. A lot. You can get that just from visiting a website. It doesn't even mean you've got an infection. Although it's scareware, somebody said in the chat room. That's exactly what it is. It's designed to scare you, and I'm glad it you worked. mentioned it. It worked, right? Did you do anything? Did you well, call actually, it? It, it can't, I No, heavens no, no. But I happen to have Microsoft regular support number. Good. Number, the correct number. Good. And I called them, and they said, oh, no, 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 that's a bogus number. Yep. You know, don't, don't use it, which I didn't. Good. However, it did pop up twice. All with right. Two different toll-free numbers. I have to. I have to. I have to take a break for news. Hang on, though, because I'll help you off the air here. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So I'm sorry. Here we go. Uh, this is a simple thing to fix, Grover. You've been trying to fix it. It keeps popping up. Uh, yeah, actually, I went. I replaced the hard drive. Holy cow! It was like, oh, okay, I'll fix it. I'll. I'll you just nuked it. The hard drive. <laughs> you nuked it. Yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> It, and 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 then I use I use your backup service, okay, that Good. you Carbonite. advertise yep, for. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, Carbonite. They they downloaded it. I couldn't get it to work. In other words, after I after I I only use two programs, QuickBooks and Quicken, are the only two programs. So they said, well, put the program files on first, programs on first, and then we download it, and then away you go. Uh, not so easy. Uh, they 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 sent me to their support dot com outfit. And they were online with me about four hours trying to get it. And they finally finally got it up, kind of, you know, to where it was working. I get the thing again. I get that same virus again. So let me again. ask you how, when you put the new hard drive in, did you start from scratch, install Windows from scratch? Uh, yes. I, I've got a two-year-old Dell, and it has a reinstalled disk that came with it. Beauty. And I use that. So you I got back, that. and then you ran all the Windows updates before you did anything else, of course. Oh yeah, and I, I'm I'm very very consistent on that. I on like Wednesday when they had that whole bunch of them, I ran them all. I run them as soon as I notified. They notify Good me, man. I run them automatically, right? Yeah. Quick. I think yeah, you're quick, actually. Quick, quick. I think you're okay. And then you restored from Carbonite. But which browser do you use? I use uh, Google Chrome. Chrome, good. Chrome's a good, good, safe browser. Yeah. You're still right. getting those pop-ups from time to time. I popped up the other day, and now I'm locked out again. What do you mean it locks you? It means no. you can't do anything unless you call you that can't, number? You can't enter. You can't enter. No, it, it doesn't. It, it, I, I restarted it. The, the other time I restarted, I had a vast on. And I think a vast knocked it off uh, the first time. But now it, a vast didn't knock it off, or they went around it or whatever, because I get the uh, where you sign in screen, you know, uh, says my name Grover, and then you know sign in your password, and it won't accept any password. I go vault. So uh, get, to get rid of uh, Avast isn't helping you. In fact, Avast okay. opens the door for other viruses. It's uh, I don't recommend any antivirus. You're using Windows 10. I had before. 
Before I no seven. Okay. Windows seven. Windows seven. And then just go out to Microsoft. dot com slash security essentials and download. Are using that? Yeah. Don't use anything else. That's a. It's not a great antivirus, but it also is not does not does not impinge on the security of your system, which other antiviruses can. Yeah, I tried Spybot. Yeah, don't and, use uh, any of that crap. That's all crap. Okay. Now. You don't need any of that. Okay. Stuff. Yeah, that's what everybody was telling me. Yeah, too. it's all crap. I, I ran the, the malware bite. I did run that. That's good. Did it? Because yeah. malware bites can help with this one. Yeah. I, I, of course, it was too late to run it on, on my desktop on the Dell, but I've got a little old 10 year old Acer laptop with Windows 7 on it, 32, and I ran it on that and it found 608. Well, that's a little spurious <laughs> also, and I, this is another thing I have to ding them for. Uh, they mm -hmm. will find things like co what they call tracking cookies and claim that that's uh, malware. It's not. So there, yeah. it's there in their interest to show you uh, being riddled with viruses. Everybody wants to pretend that they're doing more than they are. So I just right. I would right. ignore that. Malware bites. If you run it in safe mode, it has enough juice to get rid of Zeus. So what I would okay. what I would suggest is just remember the boot when this happens. Boot into safe mode because that'll keep the vo the uh, Zeus. Probably Zeus is a browser hijacker object. How you got it again, I'm not sure. Um, I've got an appointment Tuesday with uh, one of the tech guys. Okay. Uh, you got a good tech guy. Clean up. Yeah, he should. Yeah, I think you so. did a, you did a clean like install of Windows. The question is how you got reinfected. And is, is either a site you're visiting or, boy, I don't, I don't know what it is that you're, how you got it again. Or you've got to be careful about opening attachments and emails, clicking links. And well, I'm real careful. Yeah, I'm real well, careful. It sounds like you're doing everything right, and that's why I'm a little puzzled that uh, yeah. you're getting you got bit again. Right. You know, I, I you know, because now, like I say, I've got a laptop. Uh, that ten-year-old laptop with Windows Seven Thirty Two, and that hasn't got it. And I've I've been doing almost the same thing with it that I. That I do with that I was doing with the desktop, but now I've got the I've got the malware on there, you know. In other words, I put the malware on that one, you know, as well as the uh, as well as the VAT. Yeah, a lot, I, a lot of security okay. programs cause more problems than they solve. Um, I'm yeah. thinking that you backed up the data. So, did you restore the Carbonite to the old computer too? Uh, no, no, no. I do restored. It, well, I restored it to the new disk, to the new hard drive. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if. In other words, you backed up some file that included it, this is by the way almost certainly not a serious problem it's just that annoying lockout yes yes it's annoying because <sighs> i use this thing for for business i use the quickbooks of course for business and well and you don't and, want uh, anything on your system that could monitor your quickbooks login and what you're doing so right. you, you actually gotta, right. you got you do want to keep that system safe uh, my, oh, my suggestion is uh, to not run as a run as a limited user, not as administrator. Keep the administrator account for times when you need to install software or modify things, but run okay. as a standard user day to day, and that will keep this thing from reinfecting you. I don't. I'm a little puzzled. I hope that tech guy is good because, I, frankly, there's something going on that I'm not sure I understand. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, All right, and that that's puzzling me. Um, yeah, because you would think with a hard drive, a whole new hard drive, you know, and then the new. Well, did you have the problem the new, before you restored your data from Carbonite? No. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You I did. Yeah. No words. Yeah. Oh yeah. In other words, what I did is I I took that hard. Um, I'm asking hard though, drive. after you reinstalled the the Dell recovery part mode. After you reinstall, right. but before you restore your data, see if you have the problem. I'm trying to figure out where uh, that problem is living. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't try. Right. Because no, once I installed the two programs, Quicken and QuickBooks, then I had, I told... Another I told thing. Oh, the chat room's giving me a good one. Chrome will sync your extensions. And if you have a bad, malicious extension in there, it'll sync that too. So make mm -hmm. sure you go through your Chrome extensions and delete everything you don't know, you know, what it does. You don't know about it. 
Okay. Okay. You know, so Chrome will, you know, do you use Chrome Sync? Do you know what that is? Uh, oh. I think I, no, not, not if, if you, I if, don't. If you reinstalled, uh, you know, everything and reinstalled Chrome and then your bookmarks were there, that's the sync thing. Yes. And that will also sync extensions. And so that's another thing to look at is get rid of all your Chrome extensions because I have a feeling uh, that's where Zeus might be living. But I, you, you know what? It's a hard thing for me to diagnose remotely. I think it's good you're going to a tech sure. guy. He's going to take a look at it, and he's going to tell you what's going on. He's going yeah. to know. Yeah. You did the right thing, nuking it and reinstalling Windows. It should not come back. So the question is, why? Like, like, like 50 bucks. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, why is it coming back? No big is deal, it, you know. Yeah, why is yeah. it coming back is the question, and that's what the tech, you're going to ask that question to the tech guy, and he's going to tell you, I hope. Hey, I have to run, but uh, good luck. I'm glad we could talk, and I hope, uh, hope it works out for you, Grover. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. I'm the tech guy. We're talking. Yeah, we are. We're talking tech. Computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. Chris Marquardt's coming up in half an hour. Our photo guru to remind us of our assignment and to uh, help us a little bit with our picture taken. I'll also answer all your questions at 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number, 888 888- 827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Our website, techguylabs.com, has lots of information from all the previous shows, all 1,388 of them. This is episode 1389. <laughs> We've been doing this a while now. Uh, but it's got audio and video from those previous shows. It's got the links. It's got a search engine. And if you hear something on this show and you say, oh, what? i got to write that down. No, don't worry. You don't. Just relax. James is writing it down for you, and he'll put it all up there. And at your leisure, anytime, you can go back to techguylabs.com. And you know what? I don't charge you. There's no fee. There's no sign-up. There's no newsletter. There's nothing. <laughs> I don't want your email address. Just go and use it. That's It's there for you. Techguylabs.com. Mike, Woodland Hills, California. Hi, Mike. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello. Are you there, Mike? Did I push the button? I did. I hear silence. And I wonder if that's us. Michael. All right, I'm going to put you on hold, Mike. And uh, uh, Kim will just check to make sure you're still awake. And we'll go to another Michael, this time in Sherman Oaks, California. Hi, Michael. Hello, fellow ham radio operator here. Hey, W6TWT, my friend. WB6QND, Sherman nice. Oaks. You have that so, voice, too. I can hear you. Thank I you. hear you on the airwaves. I can tell. Sure. <laughs> the first... <laughs> You know, I feel like I've been like you're a friend of mine, but I've never met you. But I've been listening and watching you for so long. That's that's, that's sweet. That's why I'm calling. But you know, um, I thank you for saying that because I feel the same way. We have people come visit us all the time. We've got a lovely yeah. a couple visiting us in studio, and I I always feel like we're seeing seeing friends. You know, like we're all we're all in it together. Indeed, indeed, yes. So, um, I bought for the first time my first rig since a. Uh, Drake TR4C, so that goes back a ways. I bought a LNR Precision Mountain Topper QRP CW only radio. It's a size. So CW is Morse code. So you like Morse code, huh? Only yes. Nice. That's what I. Oh, someday yeah. when I grow up, I want to be a Morse code operator. I love okay. CW. How did you learn? Yeah. I learned it when I was about eight years old. Oh. And it's probably pretty pretty easy when you're young because. It's probably like learning a second language. So all my Elmers, we call a we call a ham mentors Elmers. All my Elmers say you got to think of it as music, not try to think of dots and dashes, but think of it as music, and then you hear it Correct. in your head. Yeah, how fast are Correct. you? Pretty quick. I mean, I can I can probably do you know thirty boards a minute, which yeah. isn't really fast. That's I had fast I've had some <laughs> I've had some you know like some dropouts in my ham radio career because of life. You know how that goes. Oh, I do. And, um, yes. Well, that's my um, retirement plan is to learn CW, to learn Morse code. Okay. You don't, I you should know, mention, I because you don't have to anymore to become a ham. And I think that stopped Correct. a lot of people from getting into amateur radio. But now you can get a license easily, take the technician test, no Morse code requirement anymore. And I like that. Yeah. I think that's getting a lot more people into the hobby. It's a fun hobby. Yeah, and there's so many things to do with the hobby now. Yeah. 
Oh, I agree. Um, and it's very important for uh, public safety, you know. Hams are out there when the internet goes down, when the grid goes down. That's why you got that big battery, I think. Uh, you can be on the air and help people for emergency. Uh, hams are great for emergency services. So, but you say you you said you got this big bat this big battery, and and what's the problem? No, 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 no. I don't have a battery. I bu I bought a QRP rig, a low. Oh, low I see. And you want QRP a battery? Rig. I need a battery for it. But this is the thing: the, the rig weighs about three hundred grams. Oh, it wow. runs on. Um, anything from 9 to 12 volts, and it's for backpacking. So we have a trip coming nice. up pretty soon. Nice. And I know I looked on the Internet for batteries, and I know there's lithium-ion, but I am a doctor. I am not a battery engineer, and <laughs> I don't know you know where to start. And so this is the thing. I'm, I'm okay to buy a bunch of batteries and take them with me. They're relatively small. I think you want a solar panel is what you want. And that's what, and that's what I was going to ask you. What about a solar panel that charges a battery? So, uh, that, so the trick why. is solar panels yeah. are grossly inefficient. We're getting better. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have them on my house and I love them. But, you know, 5% is, you know, and so uh, that's 5% of conversion of the sun energy to actual energy that you can use on your, uh, on your radio. So you're going to have a bigger array than you think. <laughs> Let's put it that, that I want, way. And I want. <laughs> and then maybe want, that you want. want. But I would go to, there's a company called Goal Zero, G-O-A-L-Z-E-R-O. Okay. And they make the best uh, devices like this. They're usually panels that include a battery. And the, the okay. calculation you're going to have to make is how much wattage do I need? You know this because you took the test. You yeah. know how to, you know, energy I need, equals... I need, I need, yeah, I need 400 milliamp hours to, I mean, that's how much the transmitter uses. I'm that's right, use, nothing. It uses 30 that's, milliamps. Can you believe that? That's nothing. So, that's nothing. so it nothing. may, in fact, be practical for you to do this with solar panels. There's well, one other thing, since you're camping, you might look, look at. There's a company that makes a camp stove. Now, remember, when you're cooking, you're boiling your coffee, you're cooking your bacon, you're generating heat and energy with the camp stove, it has a no, U.S. Not, it has, this, I'm not kidding. This camp stove has a USB port, and, and will charge a battery. Uh, I'm backpacking. I'm taking a camp stove. You're not taking a camp stove. Okay. A little no, no. Sorry. No, that's, but but it, this is, fine. I think, very cool. They call it the BioLite L I T E. It's hysterical. It's a little camp stove, and you can use it to charge a phone. <laughs> So I mean your 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 juice requirements are, m are very meager, uh, but I think I think I would look at the goal zero, zero solar panels. You could put it on your backpack because remember you know there's no charging at night, so you got to charge yeah. during the day. And they provide batteries that are paired with their panels. And I don't think That's it's perfect. given how little juice you use, you might not even have. How long are you going to be gone? These are probably three. Three day trip. Oh, you, so, you know, know it just operate. You know, yeah. If you took, you know, you can get, you can carry, you know, weighs more than your radio, but you can carry a little anchor twelve thousand uh, um, uh, watt hour battery in your pack that would power you for weeks at okay. thirty milliamps. That's nothing. Yes. Yes. So okay. since your radio requires so little, and that's because it's a, a Morse code radio, it doesn't do use a lot of juice. Okay. Um, uh, I think you don't even need a solar thing. Although, so go look at Anchor, A-N-K-E-R. They make the best, in my opinion, portable batteries. They're mostly for cell phones, but cell phones require a lot more power than your radio does. And I think you okay. can power three days, no problem. Just do the math. All right. You know how to do the math. That's the nice thing about hams. Yes. They know, you know, amps times, <laughs> amps times volts <laughs> equals watts. They know all that stuff. And so figure out what your what what your requirements are. And I bet you even just a little anchor cell phone charger would probably get you three days, no problem. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Have a where are you going? Um well we're going to Catalina Island every summer. Oh, how nice. And then I go on, on these several day fishing trips off of California. We go out tuna fishing and in the Lovely. evening Lovely. you can set up a little long wire and uh work some CW. What and, fun. Uh, See now this is a good use of the of the hobby. I love that. Sure. Where's your studio? We're up in Petaluma. If you ever make it to That's Petaluma, come come on by and say hi, George. I'm a pilot. 
And I've flown up to Petaluma. We actually got a golden retriever up there last year. But yeah. anyway, that's a totally different. Yeah, story. we did. There's a rescue dog uh, training uh, place up uh, in Santa Rosa. So, and we have a lovely little airport. I know a lot of. Yes, uh, you do. Yeah, a lot of people yes, come up there. Well, it's nice to yeah. meet you. Seven three, Thank George. You have a great trip. See you later. Take care. Yeah, uh, if you're going to power a cell phone with one of these, I, you know, you might want to get something a little, more, you know, actually hand crank. Frankly, might be a better choice than a solar panel. 8888 Ask Leo. Hey, see, we answer any question. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What are you, Leo, what are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Rocket Mortgage, my friends. If it's time to buy or refi, you want to get a new home, you want to refinance your existing home. By the way, good time to do that. I don't think those interest rates are going to stay this low forever. They're already ratcheting up, aren't they? You got to know that you want to go to a mortgage lender that's the best, and there is no one better than Quicken Loans. Just look at all those JD Power customer satisfaction awards. Number one year after year in mortgage loan origination and mortgage loan servicing, both before and after you get the loan, and 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 that's great. You know that's a great start. You got a great mortgage lender, but then I love this. They make it easy to get the loan. Why shouldn't they, right? They want you to do business with them, so they've got a completely online process that's super quick. Man, I wish we'd had this three years ago when we bought our house. It took us a month. And the bank, well-known bank, <laughs> kept asking for more stuff. They said, well, uh, okay, we need more. more like, like more document, more document, more document. It got to the point we went on vacation. We were on a cruise ship, but we're faxing them stuff from the cruise ship. Uh, I wish they'd had Rocket Mortgage back in my day. Next time we buy a house or refinance, you bet Rocket Mortgage at quickenloans.com slash tech guy. So here's the deal. You do it all online. You could do it from your phone. You could be at, you could go to an open house right now and say, hey, we should buy this, honey. Let's just see if we can get that loan. And you go and you go on Rocket Mortgage. You could do everything you need online, including submitting pay stubs or bank statements, whatever paperwork they need, and it's limited. You could even, like they've got little choose your term, choose your rate, boom, 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 press go. And you don't wait a month. You don't wait weeks. You don't wait, wait days. You wait minutes. You know, so you don't even wait. By the time you looked at the upstairs, he goes, oh, hey, we're approved. Hey, Mr. Realtor, look, see, we're approved. Bing. Bada bing, bada boom. Quicken Loans Rocket Mortgage. It's well named because it's fast and it will lift the burden of uh, getting a home loan. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, go completely online. Quickenloans.com slash tech guy. And I do suggest you uh, make a note of that because you never know when you're going to say, oh, I want to buy this house. It happens, you know, you're looking at a house and you go, oh, this is nice. Equal housing lender, of course, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumerAccess.org, number 3030. We thank Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans for making the Tech Guy podcast possible. QuickenLoans.com slash Tech Guy. Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. We go to Sterling, Virginia. George is on the line. Hi, George. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I am well. How are you, sir? Great. I've got a question about the tiny hardware firewall. Oh, you yes. Like it and you recommend it, and I recently purchased one. Okay. I'm uh, using it in client mode with the VPN enabled, and in going through the, uh, the menus, I see that uh, it looks like you can really custom configure this thing, and I'm wondering if you'd recommend changing any of the default settings to make it even more secure. Uh, it's pretty darn secure. Now, these are little uh, inexpensive, uh, basically, computers. They're sold by a company called Wi-Fi Consulting out of Virginia, and they sell them online at tinyhardwarefirewall.com. And they make a variety of them. The, my favorite is just this little compact USB key. It, it really could fit on your keychain. And in, you plug it into your USB port, but that's just to power it. And what it does, and all of them basically work the same way, it gets the Internet from, you use these not at home, but as you're traveling. If you're in a hotel or on a cruise ship or at a coffee shop with a Wi-Fi network that others are on, an open Wi-Fi access point, that's risky because others are on the same network you are. 
They can see you. And somebody who is maliciously inclined can try to take advantage of you as a result. And I'll tell you some of the things they can do. So what this does is you, you have the little tiny hardware firewall join the public Wi-Fi network. It creates its own Wi-Fi network. That's, you know, you have access to password protected. And so you log into it and it logs into the outside world. That means it provides a barrier between you and the open Wi-Fi access point. And then these, uh, the, the current ones, not only will then, so that's, that's protection number one, and that's pretty good right there. They'll also allow you to use a VPN, a virtual private network. Wi-Fi Consulting is a VPN provider. The disadvantage of these is, as far as I know, you have to use their hotspot VPN. You can't use any other VPNs with it. Uh, so it's, you know, if somebody's trying to use it to, you know, reposition themselves geographically so that they can get BBC content and they want to be in the UK or something, this wouldn't be good for that. This is really about protecting you online. But the VPN gives you additional protection. That means that even when you, you know, you're, let's say you're at a coffee shop, when you're using the coffee shop as your internet service provider, they can't see what you're doing. All they see is an encrypted tunnel, and that tunnel goes all the way to, to uh, the VPN servers run by Wi-Fi Consulting. And then there's an, another button that they can turn on that'll use the Onion Router or Tor network, which does uh, a great deal of anonymization, so it provides you with privacy. I don't think you need to turn on the VPN or the Tor router. You could just use this as a firewall, which is, you know, pretty much the protection you need. But if you're on, you know, you don't, you're on a Wi-Fi that you don't know, know or trust, the coffee shop owner looks a little sketch, turn on the VPN. It gives you additional protection. I have not played with the other configurations, so I don't know what else you can do. Uh, oh, well, apparently there's there's quite a bit you can do from what I've seen, but uh, I was just curious as to whether you... I just use it in default it. mode. I'm happy with default mode. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I yeah. tell you, you know, I'm going to South America. You better believe that I'm going to tell my wife and our kid, and uh, he's bringing his fr his cousin. We're, I'm going to say, hey, don't join any of these access points you see. Here's the access point. I'll rename it, you know, you know safe Laporte safe access point or something and say use that because I will make sure that you're protected online when you use it uh, because that I think that is a very valuable thing let me tell you what they can do uh, you know here's a simple attack <laughs> that uh, a, a maliciously inclined bad guy sitting next to you in the coffee shop he can use something they call it the pineapple the Wi-Fi pineapple he can see that you're on and then he can probe you to see what Wi-Fi networks you've joined in the past. You know, whenever you're home, you just automatically join your home network. You've got the password. You've got the name. Your phone and your laptop are just kind of, they do that automatically. Well, what he can then do, he can figure out the name of your home or some other approved Wi-Fi access point and, and then imitate it. Take the same name. And your phone will say, oh, I see a stronger Wi-Fi. Forget this coffee shop. I'm home, baby. And it'll join his network. And now he's got a lot more access to you. That's protected. Even if you were going through his network on this little doohickey, the tiny Wi-Fi firewall, you'd still be protected. So uh, it's that kind of thing that keeps maliciously inclined bad guys from seeing what you're doing. And I think it depends on where you are. You can always do it with a VPN. Uh, running software on your computer or your phone, but I kind of like the idea of using hardware. Have you used it? Yes, uh, I have, and even with the VPN on, uh, it doesn't really seem to slow things down all that much, so I'm very happy with it. I am too, I, you know, and these guys uh, have been doing this for a long time. I trust them. That's important with a VPN. Remember that you're giving all the data that you would be giving to the access point now to the VPN, so you've got to make sure it's somebody you can trust, somebody who probably doesn't log access so that your privacy is protected, that kind of thing. And they do all those things right. I like them a lot. So it's 99 bucks for the hardware, for, and that includes a year of VPN. I think it's a pretty good deal. So, no, I don't do anything else. I just use it as is. Uh, if you want to fiddle around, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> these are just little computers. They're just cheap little computers. Uh, it's kind of amazing what they can do. All right. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, I'll keep on using it in default. Good, mode. good man. Yeah, I think you. I think you. You know, I don't want to make people paranoid. I don't want to overblow the risks, 
But this is such a simple, easy thing to use. Why not use it, right? And if it doesn't impede your speed too much, that's fine. Thanks for the call, George. I appreciate it. Yeah, a chance for me to give them a little plug because, uh, they're you know, I, I really feel like they're doing the right thing, even though they are in Virginia right next to the NSA. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's the CIA. Wouldn't it be funny if this is, these are made by the CIA? No, I don't. TinyHardwareFirewall.com, hardware and they make a variety of them. They have a new one, which is kind of interesting, and I haven't really played with it very much, but they now allow you to have everybody, you know, normally when you're using a VPN, a virtual private network, all the customers are on this, you know, the same server. Now they have uh, dedicated VPNs where you get your own server. No one else is using it. Uh, and I have to look more into that, but I think that's a very uh, interesting idea i don't you know i'm very nervous about talking too much about the risks uh, of using you know online of using wi-fi access points i want you to be aware i want you to be knowledgeable but at the same time i don't want you to be afraid and it's very easy to get paranoid to the point where you just assume people are spying on you all the time and truthfully unless you are a member of congress or uh, you know uh you know, a target of some kind, a, a president of a bank, you probably don't have to worry too much about this stuff. You know, nobody, people aren't targeting you. People are, people, you know, and even if they are, by the way, once they are targeting you, you know, you better go to even farther uh, precautions because <laughs> it's pretty amazing what the, what the bad guys who are actually after you are capable of doing. We know that from just seeing those NSA leaks. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte. The tech guy. So they have an end map printout of, you know, I mean, it's really, uh, it's very easy to see what they can do. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are a gentleman and a scholar. What's cool about these is these computers have gotten so small and so cheap. So I have a Napoleon. It uh, fits on a keychain. But I also, they sent me, I should say they sent me one of these. Uh, this is kind of wild. That's 35 bucks plus 91 bucks for the year's VPN service. So it's a little more expensive than they used to be. The Yu Sun Shen. And then this is the one I love. This is the, the little Napoleon. <laughs> I, just, I just love this. I just think that's so cute. I don't think it's hysterical that they pose it next to a roll of film. Does anybody know what that, the size of that? 35 millimeters. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a router, basically. Yeah. It's not, it's not a complicated device. There's probably a Marvell chip in there. It's not. It's time once again, as you can tell from the magic music, for Chris Marquardt, our photo guy on the Tech Guy Show. Chris is a digital photographer, a talented photographer. A photographic guru hosts the Tips from the Top Floor podcast, leads amazing workshops at discoverthetopfloor.com, and even shoots film and has a great book on film photography. What's the name of that? I have it, but it's not right in front of me right now. It is the Film Photography Handbook. It is beautiful and would be a great gift. This time of year, we're thinking about gifts for graduates, uh, for, for dads. If you know somebody who's a photographer who might be kind of toying with the idea of film photography, what a great gift. And I take it, Chris, people can go to discoverthetopfloor.com and, and find that book. Everything's there. Yeah, Everything's yeah. there. Chris is actually not with us right now. He's just a floating head. He's <laughs> But I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Through the magic of uh, electronics, we've recorded this ahead of time because as, as we speak in May, uh, Chris is in Svalbard, which is 
practically the North Pole with a on a two-masted schooner with a photo group. What fun you must be having. I'm, I'm jealous. But it's 20 people, 10 cabins, plus some crew, <sighs> and we'll be circling parts of Svalbard and try to find some interesting wildlife there, which is almost a given. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Well, there's on there. reindeer, I'm sure, and I know there's polar bears. Polar bears, oh, wow. polar fox, um, oh, different... Neat. I know why you do this, food? by the way. You, you, why? I mean, you can make a living doing photo, you know, workshops, but you could do that at home. You love traveling and you love bringing people with you. What a great way to make a living. Well, this is pretty much my dream come true. Yeah. I've worked towards this. Yeah. And in hindsight, I, I see how I work towards this. Uh, looking forward, it was not that clear, but it is really wonderful to be able to do that. And I love giving people experiences and taking them with me on these tours, and uh, be it in, in to the North Pole or to Siberia, to Lake Baikal or to Morocco or uh, India or uh, the Himalayas. It's It's... I just love to be out there and to have these experiences and, and to be out there with amazing people. So You said something uh, interesting, and I think this is true of a lot of people as they look back on their life. It all makes sense at this on this side, like, yeah. it was, but it was a random walk that got you here, but it was kind of where you wanted to be, but you don't know. When, and I'm, my son is just graduating from college, in fact, just did last week, and... Uh, I'm trying to tell him, you know, <laughs> this you, you you'll see in 20 years, <laughs> but for right now, it is mystifying and a little bit scary, and and seemingly a little bit random. But uh, if you continue to follow your your dream and your passion, I, I think, think it comes out all right. I think what yeah, I think what counts is do what feels right yep. and yep. trust trust your gut. I think that's really what what agree. it comes down to. He is, by the way, an aspiring photographer. Don't. Don't tell him, Good. but I'm giving him a, a Gitzo tripod for graduation. Oh, he already, I already gave him a really nice Sony A7 camera, so now he has a... And I gave him one of those Rode stereo microphones for... You're became, spoiling yeah, him. He's going he's gonna, he's gonna to become a vlogger, right? <laughs> he, that's one of the things he wants to do, yeah. Yeah, he wants to, <laughs> wants to do YouTube videos or do uh, social videos. And he wants New to do Casey it about... Casey Neistat. <laughs> about, yeah, exactly. And he wants to do about cooking. He loves to cook. Awesome. Yeah. So anyway, I, I you know, I make sure he listens to you every week. What do you got for us this week? Well, I just have three very simple, well, well let's see how simple they are. Three thoughts about image composition. Because that's one of the things, for those of us who are more technically inclined, we know our cameras inside out um, from a technical side. But... Of course, there are things that, yeah, some, some, some people who, especially on the technical side, are kind of lack, and that's image composition. Yeah. And there are some super simple key. things. That's the key. It is, it is. What, what, what do you place where in the frame and why do you do it? And as, as, as soon as you think about these things, um, your photographer will become better. So just thinking about what is it I want to have in the frame. I mean, that's, that's the first thing. Make, make sure people who look at the picture know what the picture is about. What, who's in charge? Who's the, who's the, let's see, the, the, let's say the hero in the picture, the, the main actor, so to speak. So, yeah, there, there are several ways to do that. Of course, don't include stuff that really doesn't help. I mean, include what's necessary in the frame. Move around, around the thing you want to photograph. Take other things out, and especially in the background. That's always difficult. Um, if there are too many things in the background that interfere with what you're shooting, um, there might be distractions. Like you have a big red sign in the background that doesn't really help the picture, and then um, whichever is important in the picture is going to be less important all of a sudden because there is competition in the frame now. And... Um, the same, of course, is true with the size of things. If you, if you want to make sure that the viewer sees that one thing as the important thing in a picture, make sure it's big enough in the picture. I mean, that's very simple, but often we don't really uh, see that when we take the picture. And then later on, we'll have to crop a lot of stuff off to make sure that that thing gets a, the, the, the attention that it deserves. So just getting a bit closer is a, almost, uh, almost a safe way to make sure that your compositions go get better. Just get a bit closer or move around and see what's going on in the background. Keep is an it, eye on that background. Is it lazy to say, well, I can crop it later? 
Well, if you have as many pixels as you like, sure, why not? But I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm cheap. I want, I want all, I want to use all the pixels <laughs> in my want, photo. I want, I want to pixels. make use of that. I, I paid for them, so I'll use them. You know. Yeah, you do reduce the resolution inevitably when you crop it. Of course you do. Of course yeah. you do. And I mean, if you have 50 megapixels, hey, sure, knock yourself out. But you, you know, the 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 lens also, if you take it away. If you take stuff away, you will have less resolution. I mean, that's yeah. that's clear. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'll I'll try, and I pride myself that uh, probably eighty ninety percent of my photos are that's the way I shot them. I don't really crop much, and and the last thing is give the subject space. Whatever is important in the photo, um, I often see things that are like squeezed into the corner of a picture, and they don't really have space towards the edges of the frame or towards other things. I mean. It's of course inevitable that you have stuff in the background, but if you look at that on like a two-dimensional plane, which is what you do when you look through the camera and these things kind of touch each other, it always makes me, go, I, I want to push things around in the frame a bit to give them a bit more space to breathe. So the subject for me, either I cut it off really well so that, that it's clear that it's intentional or I give it some space towards the frame, towards the edges of the frame and towards other things in the frame. So it, it kind of has space to breathe and space to to sit in well in the picture. I like that. So that's the three things. Be clear what the subject is about, only include what's necessary, and give your subject a bit of space. Do you, you, my problem is, simple. Uh, a lot of times things are happening so fast, I don't... <laughs> I don't feel like well, I have that's time where, to think that's where about practice it. comes in. That's oh, where okay. practice comes in, you know? <laughs> right. If you if you practice, you know, you know what? I <laughs> practice every day. Every day, even if it's just boring stuff around here, I make a point to shoot at least a few shots every day of something some sometimes just on my desk, sometimes just around the house, sometimes in the garden, but I make a point of doing that every single day and it's just yeah, practice. It's moving my fingers. It's getting getting that photography to my muscle memory. So when lots of things are happening, I can quickly take that photo because I don't really have to start thinking about how do I set this up and where in the menu do I find st such and such. Yeah, well, you certainly so, have to learn your tools. Uh, yes. That's that's vital. And uh, we've talked about this before. You know, I'm about to go on a vacation at the Galapagos where I'll be doing a lot of Photography and I, I'm, I envy you for that. I haven't been there. I can't wait. I mean, it's a wildlife photographer's paradise because the animals aren't scared of humans, so they'll just apparently come right up to you. But uh, I want to keep practicing with that. And I was almost, I was tempted to get a new. You know me. I was tempted to get this new <laughs> Sony A9 that's just coming out, yeah, but I wouldn't I have enough wait. time. I'd only have a week to play with it before I you, I went. Yeah, so, that's not long enough. You will miss shots if you yeah. if you switch to a new camera. It needs right, to be muscle. I love right your before. phrase. It needs to be muscle memory. So you're not yes. thinking about the camera. You're just feeling the 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 shot. So you're you're ready to take it. Hey, you are such an inspiration. Thank you, Chris. ChrisMarkwart.com, DiscoverTheTopFloor.com, and every week uh, right here. Have fun in Svalbard, and we'll see you next time. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Back to the phones, Billy in New York City. Hello, Billy. Hi, Leo. Have uh, a nice day. Yeah, Have so nice far. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just had a little salad for your lunch. Looking out at some sunshine. Excellent. It's nice here in New York City, too. Oh, I love New York in the spring. There's nothing like it. Um, I'm about to switch camps. I'm oh. an Apple user for as long as since the Apple II was around. I was a programmer. I wrote Pyro for the Mac. But you wrote but Pyro? I, I love did Pyro. Record. Oh my gosh. Yeah, long that was time. that was a great it was a screensaver, right? Yeah, little fireworks display. I loved Pyro. You wrote that? Yeah. That was my first major Macintosh program. Very nice. Well, it was a cute little program. I used it. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately and sadly, I'm no longer really Apple's target audience. Yeah, none of us are, apparently. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> Not us so old-timers. I'm sorry, please. No, no, I'm just agreeing with you. Go ahead. Um, so I've just purchased a new computer, which is due next week, uh, for my road thing to replace a, an aging MacBook Air 1, 1 that no longer serves its purpose and i bought a lenovo x1 yoga oh you crack me up that's exactly what i bought 
Oh, well, then I'm really glad I made this phone call. <laughs> so uh, I, like you, I've been looking for, because the latest Mac laptops, I'm not crazy about the touch bar. I have a touch bar, a 15-inch, and it gets in my way. It doesn't help me. I hit it by accident a lot. Uh, and you can't disable it fully. You can only move things around. So it's just annoying. And then I, I downgraded to the touch barless new Mac, but it's kind of uninspiring. I want something more. Uh, Lenovo is doing some, like a lot of, win you know, what's interesting is on the Windows side, uh, there's a lot of creativity happening in hardware, partly because there's so many companies and they all have to find a, a, a unique angle. Lenovo has historically, at least in its high end, its ThinkPads, it bought the ThinkPad brand. And, by the way, design team and engineers from IBM some years ago. And they continue to make really excellent business computers. The yoga is interesting because it's what we call a two-in-one. You could fold it over, tent it, you could turn it into a tablet, and it's the only one that I know of where the keys retract. So the keys don't, if you use it as a tablet mode and you put it on your desk, the keys don't, you know, hit the desk. Uh, and then they offer one, which I have to say I splurged for with an OLED screen, something Apple has not done. I did as well. Well, see, I think great minds. Yeah, well, thank you for saving me have to say that. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited. I just got the shipping notification. Me too, today! <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, long lost brothers. Uh, well, I'm traveling in about three weeks. I'm going to South America, and I was looking for something light that I could do Photoshop and Lightroom on. And this is only three pounds. I think it's going to be a great traveling computer, I'm hoping. Uh, but you and I both have, I think, the same trepidation. Windows. Well, yes and no. I've been running Windows 10 uh, under parallels on my, believe it or not, Mac Pro 1, 1. And so I, I'm running Windows 10, and I also run Windows 7. I haven't missed a single episode of Security Now, and I'm a huge Steve Gibson fan. That's our security um, podcast. And Steve, of course, hates Windows 10 and uses Windows XP, which, if you ask me, is nuts. Well, he did do the Windows 7 machines, that last yeah, one with right. the old chipset right. so that he could hang on another <laughs> right. decade. Right. Windows um, 10, his concern is the privacy issue. You know, Windows 10 phones home, but, you know, all modern computers phone home, including Macintosh's. Uh, I agree. I don't uh, think that that's I, I, unusual. Uh, and I accepted long ago, I'm an Android person, so I accepted long ago that it was more beneficial for me to let Google know every single thing about me <laughs> and then to help me than to worry about them using it against me. Again, brothers from uh, uh, different mothers because uh, right. I, I feel like the value I get out of things like Google Photos so far outweighs the limited... I mean, what Google's using it for is advertising. They're very clear... They use it to customize ads. They're not selling it to third parties. I, that, I find that fine. It doesn't bother well, me. We're in agreement. So at any rate, so that I don't make everybody else on hold angry at me, uh, my, my questions really had to do with advice on the very first things to do. Since I've never had a Windows machine, this doesn't come with recovery stuff, so I know I'm going to have to make a USB key pretty early on. I don't know really what the story is with recovery partitions in Windows. Um, I have a, a Microsoft account already, so it's not like I'm a total... Uh, you know, neophyte with it. But I really wanted your recommendation. Should I use BitLocker and lock the whole thing? It's going to yes. be my yes. on-the-road machine. Anyway, yes. that's the gist. Good of questions. It. So you're right. Set up the Microsoft account and connect it. Because what will happen when you first log into that computer, it'll ask you for your Microsoft account. And then if you've already connected it to your social media, to your other accounts, to your Google account, it will just automatically, you know, populate the calendar, the contact list. It will set it up. And it's, I think that's a great convenience. It's much like a Chromebook where it already knows what accounts you use and you don't have to re-log into those. So that is advice number one. Absolutely, the very first thing you should do uh, after you set up, you know, your login and, and, you, and you get the computer running, do all the updates, is to make the uh, uh, recovery disks. Modern Windows machines come with a recovery partition, as you know, and generally speaking, they will recover from that. But uh, I always get a USB key. You'll, you'll need one of, uh, they say 8 gigs. I'd get 16 gigs. And Lenovo comes with a tool to make that recovery uh, disk. If it doesn't, 
Uh, Windows also has its own recovery partition capability. Make a boot disk that can recover. Everybody who has Windows should always have a boot disk available because that is that is often the one way out of uh, trouble. Uh, once you've done that, I, I don't think there's a whole lot more to do. I'm, uh, let me think. You know, I install my software. You might want a second image uh, with that already, you know, all installed up. BitLocker is Microsoft's own full disk encryption uh, software. And while it may not be as secure as using something like VeraCrypt, uh, an open source third party tool, it's sure a lot more convenient. When you log into your system, uh, BitLocker, you know, unlocks the drive and you're, you have access. If you lose your control of your computer, no one can take the drive out and crack into it. Um, I think it's sufficiently secure. It's not maybe not what Steve Gibson would call perfect security, but it's sufficiently secure and a very important step, especially with an SSD. You want to do that as soon as possible because an SSD can leak information if you put information on it, even if it's encrypted. So BitLocker right away. Um, let's see. Is there a downside to that? Is it going to slow? No. You know, I mean, no. we both have really fast uh, solid state drives coming. So Right. No, BitLocker, in fact, you know, that makes no difference. Uh, that those Lenovo's come with the trusted platform module chip, the TPM chip, which does the key in hardware, and uh, I think that's a very good way to do it. Don't lose your well, uh, don't lose your key, <laughs> or uh, you'll be using okay. that recovery. I lost, <laughs> I lost a little bit of that, Leo, but I got I got the gist of okay. it. I'll play yeah. it back. Yeah. Uh, you know, afterwards. Um, oh, I'm so. You so know, this is so locker. funny because I've been debating whether to talk about this because this is we're apostate now in the Apple community. I mean, here we are old timers and Apple just hasn't served us well in its latest iteration of laptops. There will be, I suspect, new laptops announced at WWDC. But as far as I can tell, I don't expect massive. There won't be any design changes. These will be chip upgrades. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm more upset, I think, about the direction the operating system is taken rather than the hardware. But I still have my fingers crossed that a year from now, when they release another Mac Pro, because I'm not updating my desktop machine first, I figured the saner thing to do would update the desktop and see if everything worked out and learn more about Windows. I know the Mac OS down to the Unix level. I'm a Unix. Sure you do. So yeah. This is this is painful. To That's me. well, and that will be one painful thing. I love the terminal on Mac OS and the ability to run real Unix programs and real Unix commands. Windows doesn't quite do that. They do have, you know, a, a Linux a Windows for Linux for Windows subsystem, but it's not quite the same. It's not the Linux kernel. Uh, you can, of course, use PowerShell, which is a very powerful scripting language. But there are some things missing that you may miss uh, and you may want next year when they have better desktops. Uh, this is an experiment for me, and I'm curious what you know how it'll be for you. So stay in touch, Billy. It's very nice to meet you. Um, and it's, it's so funny because uh, what a coincidence. We both, this, this is the second generation Lenovo X1 Yoga. They just started shipping them today. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's, it, don't go away. <laughs> it's, Billy, that's the weirdest coincidence ever. When I saw that email from Lenovo, I went, oh, I thought I wasn't going to get it till after the trip. They said ju late June. Are you still there? Did I lose you? Oh, I think he's... Full coincidence. Yeah, it's a weird, weird coincidence, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll stay in touch and I'll send you texts over the twit thing and i have never emailed you uh but getting through to you on the phone was not a difficult proposition just took a little of my time so i'm i'm, happy I'm thrilled to meet you and thank you for pyro what else have you done well i, I i'm in the television production business uh, is my really main gig. you you yeah. are my brother from another mother Oh, God, I, I followed your updates and stuff. <laughs> Sometimes I look up and I say, oh, Leo, let me run in there and adjust the monitor for you a little. <laughs> Does it look like that when we go full screen? <laughs> you know, just, but I must tell you, you're, the quality of your stuff, I'm, I'm literally a video engineer. I have, oh, maybe five Emmy Awards for doing video. Nice, nice. Uh, I didn't have the time to program anymore. Once... Steve Brecker really taught me, and I got into it. I also wrote uh, PB Tools when the oh. Power Book came out because yeah. Apple left everything out. And, yeah. Uh, wow. 
Wow. Well, I hope to meet you someday. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Billy. And uh, yeah, anytime you, you just email Leo at leoville.com. I'll respond to you. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks, Leo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and anytime you see a bad shot, just tell us so we can fix it. <laughs> No, you're doing fine. If I'm ever there, you'll have to push me out because I'm a pain in the butt. Come visit. Well, I always tell our guys, it's just a podcast. Relax. But we do want to have some standards, you know. I, I can't think of another podcast that does a better technical job than Thank you, you do. I mean that from my heart. Thank you. Uh, I, I, when I watch you, I don't see the video anymore. I, I Well, that's the idea, right? Say. That's the idea. You know, it should be. It should be. It should just be transparent. It's just a, way, a medium for connecting over, you know, ideas and uh, and thoughts and and uh, friendships. So I'm glad that uh, glad to hear that. That's exactly the idea. Well, you've succeeded, and thank it's you. A pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Real pleasure, Bill. Billy. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh wow! I was w debating whether to talk about this because <laughs> you know. And I don't, you know, it's one of those, I do all these, you know me, I do experiments all the time. And uh, sometimes they don't come out so well. But I've been, I've been looking, I've been trying to, you know, suss out what's the best Windows laptop. What, what Windows laptop would you get if you want to just get the best? Uh, price is no object. Uh, and in a way, as a comparison to the best Apple offers. And I kind of zeroed in. I know, you know, Lenovo's had their issues with the low-end stuff, but I think the ThinkPad line has always been really good. Uh, I kind of zeroed in on that. And, you know, uh, one of the people who convinced me recently uh, was Cory Doctorow, who says, I always get, uh, every year I treat myself to a new Lenovo ThinkPad, and I always get the one day uh, on-premises replacement policies is very good uh, because they, if some, anything goes wrong, they'll just swap it out within a day without you going anywhere. They'll just come to you, wherever you are in the world, he says. And he uses them for writing. So that kind of convinced me. And then I, you know, I, I'm very interested, and I kind of like these two-in-ones where they fold over, right? Because you can use them in tent mode and tablet mode. The Lenovo has a stylus, which I think is kind of nice. I got used to that with the uh, Surface Studio. I'm not a, I do have a, you know, I, of course I have the last year's Surface Book. Not crazy about it. Um, so I, um, a while ago, I said, well, I'm going to get this, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get and pre order the ThinkPad X1 Yoga 2 in 1 because their second generation was coming out, and they offer an OLED screen, one of the few companies that offers OLED screens for a laptop, very high res. Um, they, these are, they have standard USB ports. They have an SD card reader. You know, they have all the components you'd want. I'll show you the one I ordered. And I, I can figure it. I did not, I only got an i5. I did not uh, get an i7 on it, but I did get 16 gigs of RAM. And I did get um, a terabyte hard drive because I'm thinking this is going to be my portable photo editing station for, for uh, travel. So I got the ThinkPad X1 Yoga 2G, which is, I think, exactly what Billy got, which cracks me up. Cracks me up. Um, under three pounds, very thin. They say 15 hours battery life. The, you know, I asked Paul, I said, what's the one with the retracting uh, keyboard? Because I kind of, I mean, he said, I've never seen a problem with that. But this is also great. Look at those. Two USB ports, Type-C charging, by the way. And I'm hoping it's going to be Type-C with anything. Uh, it's got a full-size HDMI port. It's got an SD card reader. So... In, in my judgment, after doing some research, this is as you know, as top of the line as you can get with a Windows 10 notebook. Sports Hello has a fingerprint reader. I got black, of course, because it's a ThinkPad. 
and I got the i5. I did not. I got the i5, higher end i5, because that way you can get um, 16 gigs of RAM. I got the 10 point multi touch OLED display. It's 2560 by 1440. It is Intel graphics. It's not an NVIDIA or a third party, you know, a external GPU. Um, PCIe SSD. I got the terabyte. We'll see what the battery life is like, you know. That. But I also think I'll put some movies and TV shows on here. I'm not, you know what? I'm not crazy about Windows. But I think now that we do so much in the cloud, I don't think it, the operating system is quite as important as it was. And I think Windows 10 is okay. So I, I would, you know, when I ordered it, uh, I was told it would ship in late June, and I thought, well, I guess I won't be using that for the trip. And I just got the shipping notice today, like Philly, <laughs> and I was like, I was like on my phone at like five in the morning. I was going, <laughs> I know I'm a turncoat swipe. But I'm I'm not fully a turncoat. What I am is I'm I'm I want to see if you get the best Windows hardware you can. And I don't think Microsoft Microsoft makes very. And I love the Surface Studio, but I'm thinking very thin and light and long battery life. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We shall see. I think this might be great for travel though. I want something light to travel with. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. I'm the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. Keep those phones ringing. We're recording ahead. I'm going to be taking a vacation in about three weeks, missing a couple of shows. Scott Wilkinson will be filling in for me in the second weekend I'm gone, which is nice, our home theater guru. But we're recording those two shows because I like to give you new content. We're recording calls for those new shows, and we will continue to take calls for about 45 minutes after the show ends. So uh, if you're on the line, hang on the line. I'm going to get to everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you all. And if, you, if you're not on today's show, you'll be on a show in June. 8888 Ask Leo. Jerry Anaheim. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jerry. Hi, uh, Leo. This is the second time I called in and the second time I got to talk to you. Amazing. How does that happen? How does it work? It's incredible. Well, you got a good staff, and I'm persistent. How's that? <laughs> it takes persistence. I do know that. And, of course, yeah. Kim, Kim is the best. What can I do for you? Okay. I uh, just got back from a vacation in Italy oh. and visited my buddy. He just wrote a book about his life. Oh. I will give you his name later if you like. And I you would like it. Him. Yes. Um, the, he wrote a book, had some help, got it published. It's in Italian. Oh. So he sent me, I don't know what you would call it, a, a file of the book. Yeah. And I've been going, you know, looking for a document translator. And I found one, and I don't know if it's the one you uh, suggested on your other shows. They offer different ways, and one of them, uh, you know, was a, a, a live person doing the translation. So yeah, no computer is ever going to do anything that sounds idiomatic. It may be intelligible, but it will always sound a little odd because it's a computer. Yeah. And Google Translate's getting better and better. I don't. I think it's just a matter of time, maybe a few years, before truly idiomatic translations can occur by computer. Google. Remember, Google's throwing a lot of machine learning at this stuff, and they, they, it yeah. learns fast. But meanwhile, a human is always going to do a better job. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing is, and I dearly love my buddy because we spent some time together in Vietnam. Um, if I use the real live person to translate, the approximate price is $9,430. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, humans cost money. Yeah. You know, so I'm uh, not sure if it, uh, I like them that much. But anyway, do you have a recommendation that um, I was thinking that worst come to worst, I could take one or two pages um, and get it translated and then go to the next two pages that is so, either reasonable or free? Yeah, well, reasonable. Nothing's free. But uh, there is a form of human translation 
that is a little less expensive than that. And that is from Amazon. It's called their Mechanical Turk. And it's using kind of an interesting technique. The way the Mechanical Turk works, it's designed to parcel out small computing tasks to humans for a few cents. The, but they're easily done, and, uh, and, and, and as a result, you know, there are plenty of people uh, who are willing to do the translation or whatever task it is the Mechanical Turk has assigned for a small payment because they, you know, they do a bunch of them an hour. You can do that with translation, it turns out. You give them a sentence. Uh, and the way they get better quality translations with the Mechanical Turk is they assign the same sentence to several people, and then they attempt to reach consensus. And it turns out this actually works surprisingly well. Hmm. Good. So now what it doesn't do if you do this is, it's, as I said, it's a sentence at a time, so you're not going to get a flow, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, a great translator. I remember reading, um, you know, new translations of Homer's uh, Iliad and Odyssey, and uh, a great translator is going to bring this ancient Greek to life, you know, and even modern Italian. There's a poetry to Italian uh -huh. that you just know, you know, you can't get in a machine and you can't get a sentence at a time. Yeah. So you might, but if you're doing a small amount of translation, that might be one way to do it. It's kind of using um, a crowdsourcing, I guess, is, is the best way to do it. Some people might call it the sweatshop of the future. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's not like people are coerced into this. Um, there are perhaps other ways uh, uh using similar ideas to do this but uh, I'm not up on the on the latest there's a company called crowd in at crowdin.net that does what's called localization this is a different kind of translation but if I wrote an app in English and I wanted to have an Italian market I would send it to them and they would localize it a lot of people do this and I would bet they do uh, book translation as well they yeah, do they, they do documents for sure yeah it's a lot of words yeah well yeah. and um so to give you some idea uh you you subscribe to this and if you pay uh, the full freight at crowd in which is 89 dollars a month you could do three thousand sentences so it might still be kind of an expensive way to do it you do eighty thousand sentences which is probably enough for four hundred fifty dollars, so that's a lot less than nine thousand dollars. I would, yeah. I would try it. You have ten days to try it for free, so I would try it with a page, and just see how you know, see how the prose flows. I yeah. think, I think the reason it's nine thousand dollars for a human translator is there's a certain, uh, you know, especially with Italian, there's a, there's, it's a beautiful language, and I would, yeah. I well, would guess that you would want it to sing in the same way that the original would. Yeah, and, and it's, again, a lot of words. Yeah, well, it's expensive. I know. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's, if it's a self-published if, if it's a self -published book, there's probably not a lot of money to be made. You probably won't make back your costs. No, well, what we're doing is he, his book is published and on the market in Italy in Italian. And that company, long story, and I'm not going to get into it as far, but they only have the rights for for the Italian version. So what we want to do is restructure the book and gear it toward an American audience because what it's about, it's his whole life, but what got it started, the American audience may not look on it favorably initially until they know about his life. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, like I said, I'll give you his name later. Okay. You can Google and you can fill in the blanks about what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, and I think sounds very like a great project. And maybe there is a large market in the U.S., you know. That's, yeah, and if, if we you already got one, one lady in New York, a young girl, that is interested in possibly doing a documentary about him. Uh, yeah. And if you think there might be a market, it might be worth approaching an actual publisher, and they would foot the bill up front on the translation. 
They have translators yeah. they use. So the yeah. stuff I know about, there's another one called Babylon, which is, I love the name, Babylon.com. Also, though, really designed more about localizing applications than a translation of a book. I think there's a, ah, there's just a, there's a something, certain something that a book translation requires. Even yeah. if it's, even if it's nonfiction, you know, it's not, you know, it's not poetry, it's not Voorhees, but I think there is a certain something. Yeah. And I'll, I'll keep searching. And machines aren't great at this stuff. Do. It's going to be a human. The question, yeah. you know, the question is, who can who can you get? <laughs> yeah. You know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One more question, if you have time, you know, don't sure. mind. This is the computer thing. Yep. Yeah. Thanks to you, I switched over to Mac a long time ago. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, it's all good. Anyway, I have an older Mac. I talked my wonderful wife into letting me get a newer one, so I've been using the other one as a backup. Okay. Hard drive went down. Took it in. The genius people, a nice young lady, ran the program on it and was able to get in there. Hold on just a sec. i got to take a break. The magic music is shining. It means I have to say farewell for a moment. We'll be back with more of your calls right after this. Hang on. Sorry, Jerry. Didn't mean to interrupt, but we're, I'm still here. The podcast is still going, so yeah. continue um, on. Well, basically, is there a program, a person like me, that doesn't cost tons of money that I could try to get into the hard drive myself? And I've been, I was backing up stuff all along, again, you know, because it was an older one. And I just want to make sure I got all my pictures off. Everything else on there is not a big deal. And I think I got all my pictures. I just want to go in and re-verify. Is there an inexpensive way I could do this before yeah, I... Yeah, there's a... It, it's funny. There's a, a dearth of software on the Mac side to do this compared to the PC side. There's dozens of programs uh, in the in the Windows world, and there are very few on the Mac side for some reason. Um, remember that there are several different ways a hard drive could fail. There's physical failure, and no software can help you if the physical failure happens. Well, they were able to get in there... She tried different programs. You know, she plugged it in, did whatever they do. And one of the, I'm on, I may not be using the right words, program was able to get onto the hard drive and verify they could do something, they could get into it. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, and then they want money. Well, yeah, and then, you know, again, not a big deal. If I knew I hadn't backed up everything, and I'm, like I said, I'm pretty confident I got it all. I just want to recheck, you know, if. If if it's way. just that, you know, some da garbage data got spewed across the drive and corrupted the catalog so that the drive doesn't think there's anything on it or can't see everything on it, but all the data is still there, there are lots of ways to recover that. If there's a physical problem with the drive, nothing will recover it. Right. And, and uh, well, or actually you can often recover it at great expense. I don't recommend that. Yeah, so it's not yeah. There, there are... Um, you know, I mean, there there are. I'm, I've mixed feelings about the recovery tools, frankly, for for Macintosh. Mm -hmm. uh, and then remember that when you start running these, you know, each each time you run it, it kind of makes it harder for the next one. Uh huh. Um, but there is a free tool for the Macintosh that's specifically for recovering. Um, photos that might be what you because it's photos you want to get back right yeah again i just want to verify i did catch all those all this, is, an, this is open like source that. so it's free it's, oh good it's called photo rec r-e-c and you can find it at, at cgsecurity.org it's a particularly a file recovery tool for photos so if the only issue is that the drive got confused <laughs> uh -huh. uh, then it, then this will work fine this will recover them all oh okay good yeah beautiful so try that let me know how that works because there it's you know there are so many choices on windows and there's so few on the macintosh and i wish there were more okay yeah. i i will if i all have right. All right. results one way or the other yeah let me know like my buddy's name yeah it's Raphael minicello M I N I C E L L O. Uh, M I N I C H I E L L O. C H I E L L O. Chiello. Yeah. Minichiello. Yeah, Minichiello. Okay. 
I will. Uh, I'll Google them. Yeah, what we're trying to do is we're off the air, right? Yeah. Well, we're on the podcast, so you. Well, not... no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. What we're trying to do is, like I said, he had this one book. We want to rewrite it and gear it um, for the American. Oh, he market. hijacked a plane. Yes. Him and I were in the same platoon in Vietnam. No kidding. He hijacked it from L.A. to Rome. He, he oh. holds the world's record for the longest time. <laughs> I got to run, but that sounds fascinating. You got to put that book out. Uh, we're working on it. Thank you. Leo. All right. Hey, take care. It's good to talk to you. Thank you again. Wow, Jerry. We go back to the phones. And Alan in West L.A. Hello, Alan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. Glad you're feeling better. I am, too. Wow. It was miserable. What can I say? Oh, it was awful. Yeah. So with the wanna cry, hack, uh, wanna cry hackers, try saying that three times quickly. Wanna cry, wanna cry, wanna cry. I'm there you go. wanna cry. I know that you were not happy about a certain well-known antivirus program. You thought it was bloatware and that sort of thing. Um, that being said, is Microsoft Defender still adequate? Do you recommend an antivirus? And the sort of the B part of the question is, what about for mobile devices? So antiviruses are not completely, you know, useless. Uh, the the uh, one piece I saw about this said that about a thirty percent of all the antiviruses would have caught WannaCry. I don't. I'm not convinced that that's true. And this is one of the problems. Testing antiviruses is notoriously difficult because the real world is very different from some sort of lab environment. Uh, the, the, you know, the reason I generally. Uh, don't recommend antiviruses anymore is because if you get a phishing email with a file attached that you're supposed to run, most antiviruses will just go, well, you must know what you're doing and let you run it. And if a virus keeps you from running programs, pretty soon you're going to say, I don't want this thing anymore. I can't do anything. And then there's the third problem, which is that all antiviruses have to hook themselves into the operating system at a fairly low level. And we've now heard at least three cases, Norton was one, I think Avast was the other, where antiviruses actually became an, a door to open your computer to exploits. Because they were hooked in so low, the, the exploit attacked the antivirus, which gave them access uh. to the operating system. So you combine those three. It's of limited use. In most cases, it's going to let you do what you want to do, even if what you want to do is dangerous. And finally, it can even make you less secure. I, I just have a hard time recommending them. Windows comes now, Windows 10 comes with an antivirus, admittedly not the best antivirus. Although, again, I have to underscore, you can, you're going to read these, you know, Virus Bolt and other companies testing antiviruses. The problem is the suites they use to test antiviruses are well known by the antivirus manufacturers. So if an antivirus doesn't pass the test suite, they're not trying. The problem is not the test suite. The problem is the virus that was just invented yesterday and just came over the transom today. No antivirus is going to know about that. It's just too quick. So okay. your best bet is to protect yourself by updating your computer, being extraordinarily careful about what you uh, uh, do on the computer. Don't open attachments, especially from friends and family and companies you work with, because those are the ones that are going to be the most dangerous to you. Uh, you know, don't click on links without really paying attention. Here's another example that Google Docs. Remember the Google Share that happened a couple of weeks ago where you, you got an email from someone you know always from someone you know, saying, I'm sharing a Google Doc with you. Click this button. And you, why wouldn't you? You go, yeah, allow. And then, because it's from, it's from Aunt June. She probably wants to share in her inheritance, her will with me. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm going to be rich. So you say allow, and then it logs you into Google. Now, it does it through the legitimate Google login page. So there's no warning there. But the next page says, by the way, this Google Doc would like access to your Gmail account, would like to send and receive mail on your behalf, and would like to see all your contacts. Is that okay? Now, if you're really paying attention and you're paranoid and you're cynical like, like I'm telling you to be, you might look at that and go, well, no, why would it need that? Aunt June doesn't need my emails. And you might stop. But most people just said, yeah, 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 clicked okay. And then... They got bit because the first thing the virus did is it got all their friends' email addresses and sent the same email out to them. 
And so, no, no, the good news is Google stopped it cold in about uh, half a day, and nobody got anything worse than that. But there was no payload for some reason. It was more like an experiment. But that's the kind of thing that can happen unless you're vigilant. And no antivirus is going to stop that. Got it. Now, is running a malware bytes on a periodic basis a wise idea just to make sure there's nothing on your machine, or it's kind of like no. by that time it's already too late? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I mean, um, I use Windows routinely. I use, you know, I compute like crazy. I click a lot of links, but I'm kind of maybe a little bit more careful than the average bear because it would be very embarrassing for me. <laughs> <laughs> to, and I would, you know me, I would admit it. Um, but I, I, I feel like malware bites is a mixed blessing. And, and yeah, if you've got the infection, the real problem is, Let's say something happens. You run malware bytes. It says, you're good. I removed it. And maybe it did remove something, but you don't know everything that's on there. What about the thing that you don't know that's on there? Now you have this false sense of security. Oh, no, I cleaned it up. And you've got a keystroke logger on there or a remote access Trojan or who knows what. Got it. So the very last question, that if my new computer, so I'm thinking of buying, about buying a new desktop. Yes, I, there's a reason for me to have a desktop. If it has an antivirus installed in there, should I uninstall it or just wait till the trial yeah, yeah. ends? Or what's the best? No, 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 just uninstall it. A lot of computers come with McAfee. Some come with Norton. In both cases, dubious value. I immediately uninstall them because I don't. you don't want to feel like, oh, I'm safe because you're not. Ah, got it. You know, it's a kind. Of, it's kind of. It's a false uh, sense of security. Um, there is something that you might want to add. If certainly, if you're not running Windows 10, you should download Microsoft Security Essentials. It's their free kind of limited antivirus. And then there's something called EMET, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, which you can get uh, from Microsoft. That turns on something called address space layout randomization and data execution prevention, those things are useful. Those make it harder for a, a bad program to work. Um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Somebody in the chat room just gave me that I love. Brian Krebs is a very well-known security guy. He was at the Washington Post for years. He now runs a blog called Krebs on Security. And he's got tools for a safer PC. This does not include an antivirus. This this includes his, you know, rules that are very similar to the rules I've talked about. He's worried about JavaScript, which, yeah, can be dangerous, but he recommends a, a plugin called NoScript that makes the web very hard to use, but if you really want to be safe, not a bad idea. He does talk about EMET, which is a very good tool. He talks about good, strong passwords, hardening your hardware. These are all recommendations from a seriously good security guy. He says antivirus software is probably the most overstated tool in any security toolbox. For years, security experts have been pitching the same advice. Install antivirus and firewall software. Some market even their products with total protection. He said he, he's not so crazy about it. And, and frankly, I don't think you should use antivirus at all. Uh, Your advice is always gratefully yeah, appreciated, yeah. sir. Microsoft gives you everything you need, and it's all about you and protecting yourself with your savvy. I I am proud to say that I have not been bit by malware in a decade, uh, and never on Windows. It was on a Mac when I got bit, oddly enough. Uh, and I think that that's just prudence, really. Leo, Le and I'm a target. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Or just use Linux. <laughs> I do use a lot of Linux. More and more. That's the other reason, by the way, to finish the Lenovo story. The other reason I got a Lenovo is because they're good for Linux. So if I, if I really can't bear Windows, I'll probably use Windows because, you know, the fingerprint reader, a lot of the hardware won't work in Linux. But uh, <laughs> I do have to say there's always that backstop. And... Uh, and that means I'm, it, you know, it's not a complete waste if I decide I can't live with this. Uh, I don't know if the, how well the yoga works uh, with Linux. Yeah, it does work well. Bill on the line from Vista, California. Hi, Bill. Hi, Leo. Long time listener. Thank hey. you, sir. 
I've got a question for you. I've got a couple of old Windows machines out in my garage, and um, I've got a Mac. I've been running it since '08. And uh, what I'm planning, I don't want to throw them away because of the information I have on the hard drives. Now, I've got one of those external adapters that you can plug into USB on my Mac. I was wondering if I could take the hard drives out and get that info onto my Mac somehow. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't be a problem at all, um, especially with older Windows computers. N you know, newer computers could have a file system that's a little tougher for the Mac to read, like NTFS. But uh, if it's going to be a fat file system, it's no trouble. You're just going to uh, you need a connector. I mentioned at the beginning of the show something from a company called Newer Tech. It's under thirty dollars, called their right. Universal Adapter. You just plug that, take the drive out of the old computers, plug right. it in. It turns it into a USB drive. It's not for permanent use; it's for one-time use. Scan the drive, take off what you want, um, and and then you might. Are you going to sell it, or are you going to get rid of them? What are you going to do with it? No, well, I just I was going to dispose of the old computers, but it, the information I wanted to keep those hard drives. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so keep them. Even, yeah, yeah. So I could download it into my Mac. It's compatible. Yeah, well, I mean, programs are obviously not, but uh, all your data should be no problem. Data should be. Yeah, and reading those drives on a Macintosh isn't going to be a problem at all. They're just going to boot, you know, mount just as if it were a normal drive, exactly. Oh, okay. I just thought maybe I was going to, I didn't want to do any damage to my Mac or anything. No, 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 you won't. That's no harm. Okay, Leo, you answered it. You're my pleasure. Man. Thanks for calling. Thanks, Ted is on the line. He's next from Norwalk. Is it Connecticut oh. or California? Uh, California. Hi, Ted. Hi, how you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good, Leo. Hey, listen, um, I've got a Windows Lumia 925 cell phone. Oh, wow. A classic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sort of a dinosaur is what it really is. Yeah, I still have my 1050 lying around somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, bought it through T-Mobile, and I've had some issues with it. <clears throat> uh, most recently, the fact that I can't hear anybody talk on the other end. Well, that would kind of limit its value as a phone anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the speakerphone works and the Bluetooth, but I you know, put it up to your ear and you can't hear nothing. So, oh, that's too bad. <clears throat> excuse me, I called T-Mobile, and um, uh, ultimately we went through all the different processes. We reset the phone and everything. Nothing works. So they're willing to be good enough to give me a new phone. Wow. Um, it's actually a refurb. Um, uh, phone that is uh, Android. And so my ultimate problem here is converting all of my emails and my contacts and my um, calendar from Windows language to Android <laughs> language. Well, the, uh, the, the lingua franca, the, uh, the Rosetta Stone for that is Google itself. So on the Windows phone, you can sync your contacts, your calendar with Google. And then when you get the Android phone, you sign into your Google account, it'll just be there. Is the email on a server somewhere or is it just on the phone? No, it's on my, I'm operating through my Outlook program and the Outlook connector. And it connects so, to who? Who is your email? Uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft Live. Okay. Or Outlook Live. Yeah. Whatever. So okay. So Microsoft. That's an IMAP server. Microsoft stores that email. All the email that's on your phone is, I'm pretty sure, unless you've deleted it, still on the servers at uh, Windows. You know, Microsoft's uh, Live servers. Yeah. The problem is that um, because of my Outlook program being 2007, and they're trying to do away with the Outlook connector. Um, and it's kind of configured in a weird way. So I'm having to use um, uh, the, uh, my charter, which is, who is my ISP. I'm having to run that one through the Outlook program via POP. Okay. Then my live... POP is a little risky because, remember, POP comes from a day when hard drive space was dear. Your Internet service provider didn't want to store your emails. So they would, in general, the default would be to download the mail, then delete it off the server. Which they don't. It does It does okay. not delete. As long as it's still on the server, you're yeah, golden. You don't have to there. worry about what's on the phone. Right. Yeah. You'll just get, you can get Outlook for Android. It's actually a better version of Outlook than on the Windows phone, if you ask me. Uh, or you can use some other email program uh, on your on your uh, on your new Android phone, and just get it. Give it the settings for those for your charter server and for your uh, Microsoft server, and it should download that email just fine. So I go right to Google. Google is go. You know, f whether you use iOS, Windows Phone, or Android, 
the easy, in my opinion, the easiest thing to do is connect your stuff to Google so that your address book is stored at the Google address book. Your 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 email, well, not email because you got a different server. Yeah. But your uh, but your calendar is stored on Google Calendar. And then that way, no matter what phone you use, every phone supports Google. Uh, you know, it's funny. The Windows phone is the one that didn't. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I think you can get your stuff onto Google. If you know, if you can't, then you're gonna have to export it and get it there manually. Okay. So, all right. So I just want just to be sure I go through Google and I go directly. I mean, what, what I you know I'm trying to remember. I mean, this was one of the biggest problems I had, frankly, with Windows Phone. Uh, yeah. Was I could not tie it into Google uh, in the way that I could do it with an Android or an iOS phone. But I'm pretty sure, and you're going to have to investigate, but there's a way to get your address book connected. It may take a connector program like you've got already for Outlook. Um, I just I can't remember what the state of the art is in Windows Phone. It's been a while. Yeah. I should yeah. fire up my 1520 and see what, uh, <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's the key. Once you you shouldn't need to export stuff directly from the hardware. You should be able to sync it in the cloud. So once I sync it from Outlook to Google, will I no longer be able to use my Outlook calendar anymore? Nope. You could use both. I, I can still use, but will, yeah, they, Google, will they continue to communicate with each other so that I can still yeah. go through Outlook? Yeah, it should. In fact, the good, what, what you're not turning off the Outlook calendar. You're just synchronizing with Google. Okay, good. So, and, and, and really, I think unless you hate Google and you're worried about privacy, you know, that Google might be somehow spying on you, yeah. uh, I think it's best to use Google because right now it's, it is the, def, you know, kind of the language that's, that everything speaks. Right. So once you get your stuff on Google, you don't even care what phone. You can lose your phone, get a new phone, and all syncs up again. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, right now I am locked up with the cloud through the Outlook. Um, dot com uh, cloud. So yeah, that's that fine. In my contacts and my emails. That's and fine. That'll all sync. And actually, all synced, yeah. and you can. I mean, Microsoft actually does a very good job of offering its tools on on Android and iOS. In fact, it makes Windows Phone users mad sometimes because they do a better job on the other guys' phones than they're on on their own phones. Well, that's what I want. That's what I, sounds very interesting to me. I'd like to do that if I could do the Android. Yeah, with sure. Outlook. Get Outlook. Outlook for Android. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just log into your Windows Live account, and boom, there it is. You're so gonna love that. Outlook through Android. Yeah. Android. Yeah, and then and then it's all there. Yeah. And at that point, if you want, you can still tie it into the Google Cloud. I mean, but you don't need to. You, you know, Outlook's you know, Microsoft does a perfectly good job of storing all your stuff. Nothing wrong with it. Right, right. Okay. No, and uh, Drew Drew Nielsen, who's in the chat room, says uh, he, on his Windows 10 mobile phone and his older Windows 8.1, which yours probably is, no problem connecting to Google services if you wanted to do that as well. So you're you're golden. Uh, that's and that's the way it ought to be. I'm sad about Windows Phone. I really thought Windows Phone was quite nice, but it just came too late in the marketplace. Android and iOS really had split the world, like Spain and Portugal did in the 16th century, and uh, and there wasn't just wasn't any room for a third system. BlackBerry had the same fate. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, our show today brought to you by uh, Upside, which is really, really a cool idea for small businesses. It was created by the guy who did Priceline, Jay Walker. You know, he sold Priceline a while ago. He was enjoying life on the beach. But you know these entrepreneurs, you know how they think. He said, well, you know, I, what, is, what, is, what is not being well served out there? What could we do? What company could we create that would serve a, a, a populace that needs help? And he thought of business travel. Now, if you're in a big company... And I used to work for Ziff Davis, big company. When you were going to do business travel, you'd call them. They have a travel department. I'd call them up and say, and they'd have all my settings and everything. And they just booked the flight for me. And that was very easy. And I loved that. But now I have my own company. I don't have a travel department. Uh, if you're a small or medium-sized business, you don't have a travel department. Usually your employees are doing their own booking. So tell them to use Upside. And then they're going to want to use Upside. First of all, they save you money. Upside Kind of is like your personal travel department. They pre-negotiate hotel and airfare deals to give you amazing savings. And it's simple. 
just like your travel department, if you work at a big company, you go to Upside.com. In a couple of minutes, you just say where you're going, the date, and a couple, and they're going to get you a hotel and an air, airline. They give you a, the best negotiated prices first, so you just get a, six choices right up front. Yeah, I can use that one. That's perfect. You, by the way, no mystery. You're going to know what flight, what airline, what hotel, all that. Uh, it just saves you time, saves you money. You get all your frequent flyer miles. But here's the other part that I really like. If you're the employee doing the booking, in addition to saving your company money, you're going to get a gift card. And a, a gift card of your choosing. They have you know 50 brands, including Amazon and Target and Nordstrom. Those three alone should cover most of them. But they got other brands, too. You get this gift card, $100, $200, $300 gift card, in addition to saving money on the travel. Now, if you're the owner, as I am, I just you can apply the gift card right there and then and reduce your cost even more. So this is just awesome. Uh, your gift card arrives via email within 72 hours of booking your trip. There's no limit on trips. There's no limit on gift cards. And you save even more with overseas trips. You get a gift card every time you book at Upside.com. By the way, uh, like the corporate travel office, you get great 24-7 concierge-level service. Actually, that's probably better than the corporate travel office. You can call them. You can email them. You can text them at any time. You can even reach them on social before or after or even during every trip. So flight gets changed, boom, they're there to help. Book your business travel at Upside.com, and if you use the promo code TECHGUY, you're going to get a $100 minimum gift card, at least $100 on your first trip. But you got to use the promo code TECHGUY. You might get more. Save big on travel. Get a big gift card. Every trip minimum purchase required. See site for complete details. It's Upside.com. If you're doing business travel, whether you're booking for yourself, for your company, or you are your company, you'll save big and you get the gift card too. Upside.com. Calm. We thank them for their support of the Tech Guy Show. Uh huh. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. 88. 88. Ask Leo. Thank you, uh, Linux fan. He says Windows phone contacts are stored in the cloud at people.live.com. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, people.live.com. So Microsoft does a perfectly good job of storing your data in the cloud. I don't know why I'm so Google-centric. I am, though. I just, I know it makes it easy to me. Uh, let's move on to Randy, Orange, California. Hello, Randy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Great to talk to you. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Just ducky. Ducky. <laughs> yes, ducky. ducky. Um, I was wondering if you've heard of the Latte Panda. The Latte what? Panda. Panda? No, what's that? It's a little single board microcomputer. Oh, neat. And it uh, they're selling it with Windows 10. It comes in a 2 gig RAM and uh, 32 gig uh, uh, solid state hard drive built into it. Or a 4 wow. gig. Wow. And uh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft uh, offers this version of Windows specifically for these kinds of devices. I see this has a, uh, a Arduino compatible processor, which is nice. If you that's the coprocessor, if you're used to using Arduino, you'll be comfortable there. Um, I get, I, I'm figuring it's an ARM processor. Uh, has the Arduino uh, GPIO pinout, which is very handy because there's yeah. lots of third-party, you know, daughter boards for that. Looks cool. How much is it? Uh, the the uh, larger memory capacity version is something like 130 bucks or something. Okay. 140. Yeah, this is a big. You know, this is a big category. Intel has its Edison, and I think they've got a new platform. Uh, the idea is, you know, Raspberry Pi started it all. Everybody said, "Wow, a single board, inexpensive computer I can use for prototyping." You know, you could use this. You could make a picture frame that you know animates. There's all sorts of things you can do as media server with this. Uh, this looks good. It's actually an Intel processor on here, an Atom uh, processor. Yes. Uh, that's interesting, yeah. has an HDMI port. Yeah, that's nice. That makes it very easy to use it, uh, you know, as a, let's say you wanted to do a home theater setup. Be a good choice. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and it comes with Windows 10, which I like. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so you haven't you haven't played. Around. I have no experience with it. I should ask uh, Father Robert Ballasare. He's our 
you know, project guy. He does all the maker stuff. Uh, it's just oh. this is a big category. I'm not familiar with a latte panda particularly. Uh, but I get it from your your uh, yeah. initial reaction. Yeah. Um, the the thing I was wondering about this, and I can't find anything about it, is that it does come with a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, but I don't know if it's output only or if it's an output input. And uh, yeah, that's you, interesting. You let me that. let me look at the the specs on here. You know, if they have a audio output jack. That means they put a, a DAC on board, you know, a digital to analog converter on board. It isn't so uh -huh. much of a great big deal to make it uh, audio in. and But, uh, you know, it does say audio jack. It doesn't say audio mic jack. So it might not right. be one of those three ring jacks that has a mic right. as well as an audio. You know, that's yeah. I could see that's where you save, you know, you don't you don't do things like that. Uh, but it would be easy enough to get audio in through the USB port. You just yes. have, you just have to have a more sophisticated device on the uh, on the other end. So no, I don't know, but looking at it, I would guess it is not a microphone. Okay, well. Yeah, but let, let me you know check out with the chat room these guys. Anybody in the chat room use the Latte Panda? You know anything about that? Um, you know, I I like the you know what they've done. I like the Arduino coprocessor because so many people. And so many hardware products. There's such a big community around that 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 solves that. And the fact that it has a uh, that it has a uh, an atom processor means it's, you know, it's a pretty hefty processor in there. Uh, there is a forum at the website at lattepanda.com where I'm sure you could ask, "Hey, what about that audio jack? It does have an I it does have an I/O header, so uh, you know that that's that's what the GPIO is for, things like that." Yeah. Okay. Okay, Chief. Well, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not sure I wasn't much help, but a double O in the chat room says you can add a mic module easily through the GPIO, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Keep those calls coming. We're going to record more calls after I get off the air here in a few minutes. Uh, getting ready for the vacation. I like to have fresh content for you. Meanwhile, let's say hi to uh, Bernie in Washington State. Hi, Bernie. Hello, Leo. So nice to hear your voice. It's an honor. This is the second time I call. Thank you for calling back. Hey, uh, uh, you were talking about a good reliable hardware uh, for Windows 10. And I know Toshiba maybe is in the bottom of the line. But it uh, happened to be that about a year ago I bought me a system. It's a satellite. Do you like it? I love it. Then it's great. It. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have it's to rethink thing. Toshiba because uh, for a while I have been recommending against Toshiba. They just sent us... For review, their new Portage. I loved the Portage in its day, which was 15 years ago, for being very thin and light for the time. And this new one is sweet. So I have a feeling it's a new Toshiba. And if you've been happy with your satellite, don't let don't let me or anybody else knock it. Right. Yeah. It happened to be that when I did that free upgrade for my gateway, uh, I had an i3, and they have some issues. And I said, well, it's time to get me a new one. And yep. this is an amazing system. I got 16 gigs of memory. It's a, I like the screen, so I got 17 point. Oh, you got a monster. Holy cow. It's a monster. That's one reason to go with great. Toshiba. They're one of the few companies still making 17-inch laptops. That's that's great. Right. Yeah. And it uh, has a Blu-ray player. Nice. Um, this is not a laptop. A this, this is a tank. <laughs> this is a tank. And then two terabytes hard drive. And I'm planning to uh, change it to a... Solid the state hard drive. The thing it runs like about five hundred dollars. Do they give you access? And it's one of the things Toshiba always dealt, did well. I thought they give you access to the hard drive so you can replace it. You just open up a port on the bottom. Yes. Yeah, I no, like no, that. No, no, this one. I have to. I have to. You have to take the whole case the off. The bottom. Okay. Right. Yeah, everybody's doing yeah. that now. They used to be able to do that, and I wish they still did. But hey, you know what? That's yeah. how they get it a little bit smaller. Yeah, but yeah. that's what I was. My concern was if it, that brand. I I read so many reviews, and, and maybe customer service is not that great, which I haven't had any problems to call. I mean, you know, I haven't used it. If you don't have to call them, then it's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But what I'm saying is, it's overall it's a killer machine, and nice. uh, and I just want to put the name up there. Uh, Thank you, Bernie. And it's funny that yeah. you should do that because I just got a, uh, the brand new Portage, and I haven't reviewed it yet. I think we're gonna let Father Robert review it, but. Uh, I I had to say I you know I when they called me and they said you look it's a new company 
you know, we're really trying hard to make great stuff, and you got to take a look at this Portage. And I was very impressed. Just, you know, thin and light. So, okay, I'm going to put him back on my list, Bernie, because of you. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thanks to Michael Cozio, our musical director, Kim Schaffer, for answering the phones. Most importantly, thanks to you for joining me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.